The John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. John Anik and Kenny Florian. I fucking love them. I can't get enough of them. Let's hear that post the next. Big job there from Duffy and Frank Mir is hurt now. Oh, down goes Duffy on cold. Frank Mir does it again. Rock him, sock him, robots here. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe there are a couple of absolutely self-involved bullshit artists. Here are your hosts, John Anik and Kenny Florian. Oh, maybe arguably the most anticipated episode in the history of the Anakin Florian podcast. No, is it not? Monday, November 8, 2021, episode 324 of the Anakin Florian podcast. I'm in my daughter's bedroom. What of it? Maybe the most anticipated episode in the history of the show, Ken Flo. It's great to see your shining face. It's great to see you as well. So you're telling me that's not the wallpaper that you picked out for your bedroom. Is what no, it is my room, actually. The unicorn's mine. I knew it! It's all mine. The rainbows are mine. <laughs> so, before we get going, my family and I have booked an Airbnb for the first time in our lives for a few nights during Thanksgiving week because the uh, Palm Beach County school system decided that uh, the kids should have the whole week off for Thanksgiving. So, we're getting out of here for a little bit, going across the state of Florida, going west. And so, my wife's trying to put together an itinerary. She's like, oh, we're going to go to an escape room, right? Have you ever done an escape room? I've done it a couple times. I, I myself have a lot of fun doing those. All right. So you, twice in your life, you've done yeah. an escape room, yeah. right? Maybe you got two, out both three times. times. Yeah. Three, yeah. yeah. You got out every time. Every right? time. Does yeah. anybody Love. not get out in the hour of allotted time? Have you ever heard of somebody who went into an escape room, couldn't put whatever clues together and did not get out? Right. I don't know. There might have been another group that we were with that actually didn't get out, but I don't right. know. I don't know. Cause yeah. that would be me. Right. So I don't, <laughs> I've never done an escape room. I'm a free man right now. Right. So why would I sign up to, to go be locked up for an hour? Right. Like what if we don't get out? Oh, how was the escape room? Well, not good. Cause we didn't figure it out. And we, we were in there for the entire 60 minutes. I asked my wife, is it 15, 20 minutes? No, it's 60 minutes, you know? So, um, <laughs> I don't know. UFC, I don't know. UFC would be down a commentator or the podcast would go to shit. I mean, we'd be in trouble, John. Get Honestly, out. Just do your after homework and get out. An hour, they let you out, right? It sounds like they let you Apparently, out. Apparently. I don't know. Some yeah. places they might not. I don't know. Bring bring a the lot New of New York City snacks. Marathon, Ken Flo. Sorry to interrupt you off the top. So fucking rude. I try to pride myself on not doing that. So we'll see how many times I cut you off the rest of the show. But I'm pretty fired up today. If I was going to try to accomplish something, I would do the the boston marathon like the new york city marathon was was on sunday so the marathon's in my head i'm thinking about maybe doing the boston marathon in the next couple of years that's something i would do but like an escape room like am i gonna feel like oh I'm out of the escape room man you know i don't know if it's good for the kids the all ages made me more encouraged that i could actually get out but i don't know man i don't know you kind of have to pretend like you're this uh detective you know, when you're in there, like you're looking for clues and I, I, I it's exciting to me, but I, yeah. I don't know. It's not everyone's cup of tea, but I, uh, I'm right. curious to see what your right. experience is. Like. Yeah. Doesn't yeah. dovetail with my skills necessarily, but we'll <laughs> see. All right. So UFC 268, I mean, bro, like, I don't even know what to say greatest card in UFC history. There's so many singular performances that we have to get to that. I shouldn't have spent all that time talking about an escape room. We'll start with the main event. Ray Longo coming up in five minutes. We'll also talk to uh, the people's reporter, Aaron Bronstetter from TSN Sports. Uh, and James Krause, after a big week for him and Ken Flo, coming up in the main event challenge because the UFC's wheels keep on churning. But Kamar Usman and Colby Covington go the distance. Um, I have been listening to Colby Covington's walkout that, what is it, Kurt Angle's walkout song, just nonstop in my house since the fight. Uh, so, um, but Colby Covington... Uh, certainly never looking for a way out, right? I have a lot of respect for him in defeat, but Kamar Usman is one of the UFC's all-time great fighters. And if you weren't using the word legend uh, before Saturday night, uh, you certainly got to use it now. He's 15-0 and in the UFC. Strength of schedule as good as any champion in UFC history in any division. And um, just another huge win in a career full of them for, uh, for the Nigerian nightmare. Yeah, listen, Usman's a beast. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of these performances where 
he really is shining when all the pressure is on him now. And as champion, he has improved as a fighter. We've seen him get better as a striker. We've seen him uh, become more confident in that role as champion. And we saw that yet again here against Colby Covington, a guy who was extremely motivated, who has improved a lot himself and certainly had an argument for, you know, getting that fight stopped in, in round two. Usman was all over him, dropped him twice. In my mind, I thought that, could have, could have very well have been a, a 10-8 round for Usman. And Colby Covington, to his credit, came back, fought hard, won round three, won round four, in my opinion. Uh, and then it was Usman who, you know, ha had to do a gut check and found a way to win uh, yet again. And I agree with you. He's one of, one of the best champions uh, that we have in the UFC, no question about it. He's extremely impressive and, and on his way to uh, Hall of Fame status, man. Um, just blown away by by him and what he's been able to do in the octagon. Cody, while we're talking, can you just throw the 10-8 scoring language uh, in the private chat so I can have a look at that? I promise I won't bring the program down with it necessarily. But uh, for Colby Covington, right, uh, Daniel Cormier texted me that uh, that it was a tough scene in the locker room afterwards, you know, because I think he's smart enough to acknowledge that there's some sort of gap here that he hasn't closed to the extent to which he would like to close. Now, Kamar Usman in his post-fight interview was very complimentary of some of the work that Colby Covington had done, you know, like he has developed some power. You know, some people argue there's a lot of um, natural gifts and God given power. There are other fighters that train for power like Michael Chandler, but clearly Colby Covington even though maybe he landed more big shots, big shots in the, in the first fight at UFC 245, clearly Kamaru acknowledged Colby's improvements in the power department in terms of some of the footwork. And I don't know. I think that team deserves credit. I do think Colby Covington can get better, but right now, Kenny, it is a minus 300, minus 400 gap. You know that we saw on Saturday night. He's in a tough spot. I, I think that he fought his ass off, and uh, Colby is one hell of a fighter. You just get the sense that Usman is just. Uh, more of a beast physically, right? He's he's a lot larger than Covington. He hits harder naturally, it seems, uh, than Colby did. Uh, I think Colby's speed was impressive. Um, I, I don't think Colby is as good of a wrestler as Usman is. So whatever Colby does, Usman does a little bit better, right? Doesn't mean he can't win the fight, uh, right? Because anything can happen. And he did hurt Usman during that fight. It just Usman was just a little bit too good everywhere for Colby, and uh, we had a hell of a fight be be because of it. There's one line, Kenny, in the scoring that I just have to say to you, okay? Mm -hmm. A score of 10-8 does not require a fighter to dominate their opponent for five minutes of a round. Do you understand how vague and hard it makes it right. for the judges, right? Because the first line of the scoring is a 10-8 round in MMA is where one fighter wins the round by a large margin. But it does not require them to dominate for five minutes, right? So you don't need duration. Yes. So two knockdowns should be a 10-8 in my opinion. But the scoring language is so poor and so open to interpretation that I'm going to pardon all three judges as to how they scored uh, round two. Let me ask you this. Would you have scored it a 10? I would have scored it a 10-8 round. Would you yes, say I would have. that? Yes, I yeah. would have. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Because I – read that as like letter of the law. And I don't know that the sure. judges do, but obviously the language has been tweaked, however poorly to encourage judges to be more liberal with 10 eights. But in terms of Kamar Usman and his future, uh, he's been very busy. He's obviously made quick turns as far as champions go. He's been a promoter's dream, but it's not as though there's a wealth of options. And that's in some part because his Nigerian friend, Israel Adesanya is the UFC middleweight champion. I mean, if anybody has laid a case to have a shot to become a double champ, it's Kamar Usman. And it's a favorable matchup, right? Might even be favored to beat Izzy. But yeah. that's not happening right now. So uh, you're the promoter, Ken Flo. Put on your fucking promoter's hat. Uh, who's next for Kamar I think he waits for to see what happens between Leon and Masvidal. I think that if Edwards wins, I think that's an intriguing fight. Got to be the guy. And Ed Edwards is a, an excellent striker, really has improved as a grappler as well. Uh, cool, cool customer in there as well. And, and I think he has the experience now to perform well in that championship fight. Uh, with Masvidal, I, I don't, you know, listen, they've already fought twice. That fight's not going to happen again uh, for the third time. And of course, you know, you have uh, Chimaev kind of waiting in the wings and, you know, he might be one, maybe two fights away potentially uh to, to to fighting uh, Usman so that that's definitely a fight that will happen as far as Usman going up to middleweight 
that would be really intriguing. I, I think that you'd have to pay them a lot more money. And I think if there's a lot more money on the line, they would absolutely say yes to that. Yeah. I think they would both deserve that money. And uh, shit. I mean, how, how many super fights do we actually get in the UFC? I, that's one I would love to see. Yeah, ain't going to happen between those two. Uh, I feel like I should look into the camera, Ken Flo, and say, Leon Edwards is worthy of a title fight right now, okay? But since he has a fight on the books against Jorge Masvidal, if he wins that one, absolutely he deserves the title shot. Yeah. And you got to think, because those two have fought way back in Kamar Usman's career, that you got all you need, right, to build it. I, I certainly think Leon gets that opportunity. There's a whole different conversation if you're talking about sending one welterweight in the world in there right now to save a dog's life. Who does the public send in there? And we're not going to have that conversation right now because, as I understand it, Ray, Ray Longo is with us. Like, are we being polite this week, Cody? Like, you can't just throw him in the room. There he is. Set her up your camera, Ray. Yeah, Ray how's that better? Yeah, I'm, look at that. I'm hanging off my couch. What do you want me to do? <laughs> You're pretty well centered, though, Ray. You're I learning. Know, You're learning. Cheek, I like one it. cheek on and one cheek off. I'm not going to do well in this interview. <laughs> it's horrible. Interview. Interview. <laughs> this interview. Uh, or what are we? You're are wound we up, man. I am is, absolutely wound up. Is everything just? You're just happy to be home. You have no idea how happy I am to be in the United States of America and the great state of Florida where it is absolutely beautiful and to see you. But you just said this interview, right? Don't group us in with your extra rounds and your yes, whatever the good. UFC's, um, you know. That was a slip. <laughs> all right. Yeah, because this is not an interview. This is supposed no, to be fun is, with your friends. No, I this mean, is my peeps. Yeah, and I, and I got you. Yeah, it's just I right. had so, right, a rough good. weekend if you didn't notice. Yeah. I'm back yeah. in the L column where uh, you had me four weeks ago. I was doing good. I, well, you. Yeah. you got your wish. Get the fuck out of here. Get the <laughs> fuck out of here. You went to New York for three days. Get the fuck out of here. I had, what the <laughs> fuck are you doing? Get the fuck out of here. So I had seven saying. nights. Seven nights at the Hilton. I barely saw Ray. Uh, you and know what? No yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, no sooner does Cody ask me if I've seen Ray, I say no. I come down to the lobby to get my Chinese food, and there's Ray in all his shining glory. Yeah. You Which Chinese food, John? Uh, that was probably sketchy on Kitchen. Go ahead, Ray. Oh, very nice. Uh, yeah, I tell you this. You know, being in New York, I, I swear, made it worse because nobody was staying in New York. Everybody was on the island. You're going back and forth. It was just wacky. And then – right. Wednesday, Wednesday late afternoon, man, I scratched my cornea. So I was down. I mean, I was. How'd uh, that happen? You know, Kenny, I, I tell you, I was working out. I thought my left eye, the contact maybe was dirty. I went to take it out. And I'm telling you, by the time I drove home with one eye, by the time I got home, it, I was like a nail was going through my eye. Oh, man. Oh, man. Went to, I went to urgy care. No antibiotics. She no. She put that special light in there. She said, "No, you scratched your cornea." And then she gave wow. me these antibiotics. And then uh, CVS was closed due to COVID. I couldn't oh, get in touch with nobody. So, a friend of mine's wife had an eye problem. I said, "Is it an antibiotic?" He goes, "Yeah." I go, "Bring it over." It's like eleven thirty at night now. I'm I'm dying. I'm and sure. I, I would have walked out. My eyes water just hearing this. Eyes oh, are no, no joke. John, Listen, I if I if Al talks to me that night, I tell him I'm not making it like this. Wow. Yeah. And then uh, he brought over something. And uh <clears throat> by the next morning, my at least my eye felt better. My vision still sucked and I couldn't put a you know, I couldn't put a contact in. All right. So um Jeez. that was it. By uh by Friday I felt way better and I went in, that's when I got to the hotel. But I was I was down for the count. I didn't do anything Thursday, just walked around with sunglasses on. Jeez. It's what crazy. do you mean CVS is closed? What are you guys doing there in New York? Ken uh, CVS no. open in North Carolina? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course. Right now, everything was messed up. This, what? You, I'm telling you, you don't want to get sick right now. in New York, anywhere, <laughs> yeah. Probably anywhere, but it's not like it used to be. You yeah, know, man. wait outside, knock on the door, say a secret code. Like, uh, yeah. if I wasn't in pain, I'd just turn around and go home. I went for a nice walk uh, towards a park in New York City one night, Ray. You know what? I saw a bunch of fucking rats. <laughs> I, I heard Boston has a rat problem too. I'm just saying, you know, a bunch of rats in New York City. I'm sorry. I'm just having fun. Just having fun, folks. Those Everybody's rats so sensitive. Have, did those I can't wait to talk about Kamzat Shimaev later. Yeah, did, you? <laughs> did those rats have two legs or four legs? Some have uh, two. Some have two, Ray. Big. 
They were There's pretty a lot of big. Rats in New York now, more than ever. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Yeah, a lot of two-legged rats. That's good. I'm a little slow on the trigger. That's good. Oh, I, used to be, I, was, I was backstage. It sounds like you were guns blazing. Yeah. Uh, what we got? So what do we got? I guess we'll take that off the air. I'm very curious, you know. I'm ready, though. I'm always ready. That's the All difference. Right, so- like 18 months ago, I wasn't ready to fight. Now, I'm not looking for a fight every night. But I'm ready at the arena. Like I'm expecting someone to start with me, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, you've you've elevated you yourself to that position. That's a good position to be in. You know, if you're not hated, you're doing something wrong today. I agree. Yeah. So we have so many things to get to, but obviously we're going to yeah. start with you with uh with Ally Quinta and uh you know didn't even get to the Ray Longo corner cam. It was a quick fight, two minutes and twenty five seconds. Bobby Green's last 10 fights went the distance, and clearly he was uh, out to prove something this weekend. You know, James Krause came on our show and was pretty convicted in his belief that 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 Bobby was going to win in some part because of Al's inactivity. Um, juxtaposed against Bobby Green, who's been one of the more active guys on the roster. What would you make of, uh, of Al's fight? Yeah, it was really not much to make of it. You know, totally bummed out. Al's, you know, one of my favorite people. So I know. That, that sucked. But hats off to Bobby Green, man. I really like Bobby, even for his, you know, uh, behind the scenes stuff as much as uh, I like watching him fight. So great job for Bobby. Hats off. I, that's probably all I'm going to say. But I really like Bobby Green. I like the message he delivers and uh, wish him the best. Uh, I'll be rooting for him in the future. How was Al's warm up? The warm up was yep. pretty good. His yeah, was really good. Yeah, yeah. And is I'll there anything you have for us on the last? On the mitts. Anything you have for us on Al's last six or eight weeks? I mean, he. It seemed like his body cooperated in physical therapy. I don't know. Yeah, look, he's he was he's in physical therapy like three times a week. I mean, he's he's struggling with some stuff, but no excuses. We made the decision, do what we did, yeah. and uh, and that's that, man. He's yeah. uh, it it just sucks because. Yeah. I know he's obviously better than that, but you know I don't yeah. want to even say that because I really yeah. I, I Bobby did a great job, and that's that that's the way I'm leaving it. It is what it is, yeah. but um, I just you know whatever. It, it's yeah. all, it's no, that's fine. He, he Kenny... felt great. He felt great in the back. Aljo said he felt great. He felt great on the mitts to me. He was hitting hard. He was accurate. He was fast. It just sometimes that's what happens, man. But you know the inactivity. James is probably right. Yeah. Uh, but he did look good. Everything he did, he looked good doing. Uh, but he does struggle with some issues. But when he was on, he's always on. So. Yeah. Uh, Ken Flo, I'll get your thoughts on Bobby Green later because I know we were all very impressed. And uh, that dude deserves shine for the way he has handled the last yep. few years and really his whole career in a lot of respects. Um, definitely going to be able to buy a third house now. Um, as far as the co-main event was concerned, Ken Flo, we'll start with you. Rose Namajunas over Zhang Wei Li by split decision. Um 49 46 48 47 dissenting judge 47 48 for Zhang Wei Li. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I thought Rose Nama Yunus won the fight pretty clearly, um, and had to use every every bit of her skill, uh, in all areas to get it done. What'd you think of the co main, Ken Flo? Uh, I thought it was a tremendous co main. I think if this fight happened a few years ago, we would not have seen this result. Uh, I again, I, I can't stress enough how different Rose is mentally to me in, in my mind and how she's coming off and how she kind of was able to make the proper adjustments. She went out there. She was uh, making sure that she was the longer fighter out there. She was using a lot of long range strikes, her jab, her kick. She was keeping uh, Zhang Wei Li on the outside doing a great job. But then uh, Zhang ended up coming back. She was hitting takedowns. She won the second. She won the third, in my opinion. And then Rose had to battle back. She made the proper adjustments. Won round four. I thought that was pretty close, but I thought she won that. And then round five was a clear victory uh, for Rose. So it came down to that fifth round. This was a big-time gut check for her. No doubt. And seeing how she responded, I was extremely impressed and i think she's going to be very difficult to beat rose uh is just firing on all cylinders she didn't have a perfect fight but i guarantee right. you she's going right. to come back even better for the next one yeah ray what'd you think of rose nami Yunus? are you back at home or at the hotel watching this where are you for this fight um, I, I was i was back at home by two o'clock in the morning <laughs> just we yeah. we all watch look at first off what a great night of fights right i mean i think this, unbelievable I, it was like five fight nights packed into one so Ken, yeah. even when you're talking about Rose, by the time I got to Rose, after Gaethje Chandler, after Frankie, after yeah. 
after uh, Billy Q with the heart of a fucking lion. Crazy. I don't even know what I'm looking at. It was like five fight yeah. nights in one for me, and we all watched the fights together. But look, Rose, Pat Barry, Trevor Whitman, but I, you're not getting better people. They're, they're just nice people. They deserve everything they got. They get, and uh, I love the corner work. I love what they do at Rose. Rose is a sweetheart. Kenny's right. Absolutely controlled the range. When you when you see a person missing big, like swinging and hitting air, that's the sign of a great fighter on the other end, right? That mm -hmm. girl really kept. I I'm, I'm with you, John. I think it was not a split decision. She won that fight. Uh, unfortunately, I do think you know just to secure it, she needed that big fifth round and. Fight IQ off the charts. That takedown was beautiful that she hit yep. on. Her. And that cemented the fight, obviously. So, you know, I, I agree with everything Kenny said. I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, it was just a, a great – she's just so nice to watch, and you got you have to root for her. You know, and it's like there's certain people – look, to me this whole night, the sportsmanship was what won. I know, a hundred percent, man. You know, I, that's, as yeah, a play-by-play -play guy, it's like I'm trying to like figure out how much to lean into that, Kenny. Right? Because uh, yeah. I keep seeing it. No, you have to lean into it, John, because we need more of this. It'll it it it'll bring people together. I mean, yeah. I really look. I'm bummed out, but I'm not bummed out because of what I saw from these athletes this time. Uh, Volante, Volante's guy. You people die to get two seconds with Joe Rogan. This guy decided to give it up to Volante. He made it about Volante after a while. What this guy? I, how could you dislike this guy? You know what I mean? The like what a chip crazy... was all over the place. Nasordini Mavov, you know, repeatedly yeah. apologizing to Edmund Shabazian. You know, not trying to like destroy your face oh, for two months a... in the crucifix, but beautiful. Yeah, right. I like Bobby Green. I love the way he's got a great message. I think he's yeah. live. Look, nobody's perfect in this world, but man, you just keep trying and pushing forward and getting along with people, you know? So to me, that was the big takeaway, man. When that guy, you know, gave it up to Volante on his last fight, Unbelievable. I, I, yeah. I just, uh, that that's not a selfish guy, man. That's a, that's yeah. a good dude. I don't care what that guy does. He's a good yeah. dude. Just on Can't that fall. note, got to hang Go out on. with Glover Texera a little bit, light heavyweight champ of the world. Yeah. You'd never know it. I Everybody know. should look at this guy. He's humble. He's nice. He's polite. The guy, act like him. Trust me, you don't want right. fans that, you know, want the other bullshit. This right. guy is on the money. I just, right. every second you talk to the guy, he's just a great guy. So right. I think there was a lot to learn. So I, I took a lot of takeaways for me. But uh, getting back to Rose, just another, you know, great performance. And Kenny's right. She had to dig deep. But that that fifth round, that, that takedown was beautiful. And that, yeah. I think that put the icing on the cake. And she, I thought she fought a great fight. You know, could she make improvements? Yeah, a little bit. But. She she went like again. That girl was swinging for the fences and hitting. Oh, yeah. and that's because Rose understands distance yeah. and she understands how to control the range of a fight. Beautiful footwork, long jab in and out. What's not to like, man? I I could watch her fight all day long. New segment on the show next week. Five fighters Ray Longo would never coach. We're gonna come up with guys the opposite of of guys like Glover Teixeira. Five guys Longo would never coach at Anik Florian Pod. That'll be a fun segment, right? Yeah. Put John All right, Jones, so, uh, put John Jones <laughs> on the top of that list right now. Uh, there you go. Oh, there man. Go. He's looking man. for a coach, right? We're going to send yeah. him over. Now he's having fun in his garage where he belongs. <laughs> I can't even encourage that athlete anymore with like a thumbs up on Instagram no, without the whole I, fan I, base coming I, at me. So, you know what happens? Like, you know, there's that old saying if there was never bad in the world, you wouldn't even know what good is. You know what I mean? Like, when I talk to Glover, man, it's just what a different cat this guy is. He's just, you know, the guy, you think right. he's walking around swinging that belt over his head as he's, well, you wouldn't even know he's in the room. Yeah. You know, he's helping his teammates. He's just, just a great guy, great energy. Yeah. Man. Yeah. I mean, I just before the show started saw another one man almost run over a guy on purpose with his truck because the guy was taking too long to cross the street, right? Oh, you know, yeah. Some people, man, some people, <laughs> it's Floridians, my God, <laughs> giving the rest of us a bad name. <laughs> so in terms of what's next for Rose Namajunas very quickly, and people are probably like, can you just talk about Gaethje and fucking Chandler already? But for Rose Namajunas, it's interesting because I do believe that she will be a two to one or more favorite against almost anybody in this division. I mean, the Carlos Bars, a matchup stylistically, is intriguing because it's a rematch because Rose was two and one the first time they fought because as far as I has all, all this momentum and 
a lot of strength as well. Uh, Marina Rodriguez, I think, is an intriguing challenge. But Kempfo, right now, I thought that of everything you guys said about Rose's performance, the thing that resonated with me the most was the first thing out of your mouth, that Rose maybe doesn't win this Zhang Wei Li fight a few years ago. She's so composed, the ability to adjust, and this experience is so good. It's like, these are the best title fights to win, right? Like, And he's like, she ain't going to have to fight Zhang Wei Li now for three more years. You know, right. it's like really got the finality i thought even in a relatively close fight and it's just a perfect experience into to use into that next title defense she, she dealt with so much in there you know on, on you know the the technical adjustments that she had to make you know deal, her leg was pretty much compromised what first 7 minutes of that fight you know and, and that's a big part of her game that footwork so i thought it it was an awesome fight from Zhang Wei Li just rose was just that much better and was able to uh, make the adjustments and come back and, and execute the right uh, decisions out there, uh, especially in that fifth round. So um, it, it's great to see someone like Rose come into her own. We, I, I think anyone who saw her early on knew that she had all the potential in the world, and we're, we're seeing that realized now. And, and Is it, John, let me just say one thing there too. You know, you look at her fight with Joanna. I mean, back and forth, it's a battle, right? That was a great fight. One side, the other side, one side, just who's going to break first. Rose don't give you that chance. That's the beauty of Rose. She's not engaging in that. She can control you. That's not a, a, an easy thing to do. And that that's the difference. I, I think the tough fight for Rose, but the girl probably moved up. Who's the, the, the girl gave her a really tough fight for three rounds. She was coming on strong. Jessica Andrade. Andrade. Yeah. I agree. Up? See, but I. A five round fight would be really intriguing because. Her third round was huge against Rose. So I think that type of relentless pressure where you don't care, you're getting hit, you're gonna eventually get there. That that could be a like that that's an Ali Frazier scenario, you know. Kenny, yeah, and, I don't even know what styles make fight makes yeah. fights really means, but that, like Andrade, I point. walked out of that Andrade Rose fight thinking like Andrade won, right? Like, you know, like I mean, sh dude, like that third round. Ray, that's yeah. a great point. Like yeah. that's yeah, a so good match. There's another two Andrade. rounds to that fight, then we're really gonna have to dig down deep. We'll yeah. really see, yeah. you know. Yeah. But that, that so, that's what comes to my head for that. Are we disallowed because of music rights to have Colby Covington's walkout song playing <laughs> behind us right now for the whole shit? Dana, right? I mean, I counted Cody. Are we not allowed to do that? I mean, Ray. I mean, we could go in so many different directions with you. We have about 20 more minutes or so. Cody gives me an LOL. I guess we can't do that. Da -na, don't cut this up, Cody. Da -na, you have to listen to the whole show to get this type of content. You don't just get this on fucking Instagram. Ray, I'm just so impressed with, with Usman and Covington. I mean, you got like 60 seconds of efficiency for me on the main event before we try to tackle some of the rest of the stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think he came out a little tentative. Uh, Colby? Which, what was that? Colby? Kobe, I'm too, yeah, Kobe, I'm sorry. Yep. Um, but all in all, a great fight. I mean, Kobe, look, Kobe, he's, he's tough, man. He proved it in that fight. He got rocked. He was, you know, he was in trouble. But, man, he came back, and I thought he won. He definitely won f uh, three and four, I think. I think I had it even going into the – I'm not really sure. I'm telling you, by the time that fight came, I was delirious from the highs and lows of every other fight. Right, I was, right. I was exhausted. I know. You know, I know. We, we all – I watched the fights with Al, Al, Joe Weidman, Matt. We just had a great time, but it was exhausting by the time I got to that fight. I, I'm telling uh, you. Like, but Kobe, tough, and had his moments. I thought he rocked him a little bit. I like the fact that he at least, uh, you know, he did get a takedown, and he was pushing that. I would have liked to have seen that earlier. I think would have maybe worked out a little better for him. But all in all, uh, it was a good, great fight, another good fight. Those guys, unfortunately, he's probably never going to beat that guy. Uh, right. You know, we really want to make it interesting, and I think Kobe does wouldn't want to do this. I'd like to see Kobe against Chimaev, and uh, the winner of that gets another shot. Yeah, you know? I just don't know if the calendar is going to align because Kobe is going to need a lot more recovery. Kamzat yeah, Chimaev yeah, yeah. wants to grapple Jack Hermanson in eleven days, and then wants to fight December eleventh. Even though I think he's going to be prevented from doing both of those things. But hey, I was asked a year ago for my dream fight for 2021. And my answer was Colby Covington versus Hamzat Chimaev. So there you go. Wow. See, yeah, I mean, we're not as different as you think, Ray. You know, <laughs> we're more aligned than you think. <laughs> what is what? You Are you feeling sensitive today? Who said we were different? <laughs> I'm going to put up a video of Aljo ordering at an Italian restaurant later. It's a classic. 
It's yeah. a classic. Yeah, that's can't wait. I don't know why I'm saying um, that. Now, what, but couldn't have sent that to me, right? I could have played it on the show. We could have had some content. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I should have done that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we could, we could always, we could, this, this might live on forever. Who knows? <laughs> All right. So, and Zhang Wei Lee, I do think, not unlike Colby Covington, if a different person was champion, I certainly think that she could get back there, you know? Um, and I'm oh, very yeah. curious to see if Joanna Young Jacek will come back at some point. Um, but we'll see what happens with uh, with all of that. All right. Justin Gaethje versus Michael Chandler. Um, you know, what's interesting. We're going to talk to uh, to Aaron Bronstetter here in a little bit. And, and he tweeted out something to the tune of, you know, this might be. The fight of the year for 2021, it might go into the UFC Hall of Fame. Both of those things are probably true. And yet it might be Justin Gaethje's third or fourth craziest, like most exciting <laughs> fight. You know, I mean, so but. I this this is the greatest card in UFC history for me. Uh, now I have a great answer when people ask me that question in interviews. Uh, and this was the fight of that night. So Ray, what'd you make of uh, that madness between Gaethje and Chandler? And uh, if Chandler was your pupil, would you be upset that he uh, wasn't a little bit more technical? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Listen, I don't think you can you can only rein these guys in so much, right? Yeah. You got love, I love Michael Chandler. I don't really know Gaethje, but I would think I would love him because it's just I do love him <laughs> without yeah. knowing him. Yeah. He just yeah. these are these are fucking berserkers, man. And but did they match up perfect on that night? I oh, didn't know yeah. when, when Chandler was even giving him the, the fingers to come back in again. Yeah. I mean, Chandler, I mean, if the, this was a movie to me, I mean Chandler knocked it out of the park, <laughs> you know, if he was if he was acting in a movie, but it was for real. And uh, the shots that those guys took and had to endure and laugh about it after the fight, these are two – I think Gaethje said it, man. I think he said it after the fight. They belong in the uh, in the Coliseum, these guys. These guys uh, – yeah. they should have just put that fight yeah. kept going until one guy just couldn't even move anymore because that's, that's what you had. But uh, technically, I think Henry did the right thing with him in the corner, you know, like – you're a little quicker than him. I think he probably could have just employed that jab. It looked like he couldn't miss him with that. But uh, then he started getting hit with the uppercut. And Gaethje found a home for that a bunch of times. And I was just a I, – I can't imagine talking to either of those. Those guys are going to do yeah. what they do. I think yeah. you have a little bit you can interject. But at the yeah. end of the day, when it's go time, uh, you know, when Gaethje was showing signs of, you know – some technical ability that he is technical, but you know what I'm saying? Like in the other fights, he fought smart. He went right back to yeah. let's see who goes down first type of mentality. Yeah. It was, it was, that's about as fun and as good of a fight as you're going to see. Can flow. How good was that? Huh? Just ridiculous. If you're not a master grappler, right? So if you're, a, if you're a striker, any kind of striker, I don't care what your pedigree is. I don't care what you've done. If you fight Justin Gaethje, you're going to have to walk through hell. That's it. Period. Period. How many, how many people, maybe up to middleweight would have been knocked out in round one in that fight? It's just crazy. The shots that, Ch that Gaethje ate, it was crazy. The shots that Chandler ate, uh, again, you know, how many times do we have to come out of a, a Gaethje fight or a Chandler fight just surprised at the amount of heart and toughness and determination that these guys have? These guys were pretty much made for each other. This was our kind of yeah. uh, Ward, Mickey Ward, Arturo Gotti yeah, fight yeah, in yeah. a lot of ways. Just insane. Uh, I Right before the fight, I said, there's no way this fight goes the distance. And sure enough, you know, this fight went the distance and we had ourselves one of the best fights we've ever seen. You you could have ended that fight after five minutes, all right? And the rest of the pay-per-view could have been crap yeah. and I would have been satisfied, yeah. <laughs> okay? Yeah, right. We I got know. 15 minutes of some of the most insane action you ever see. It was a movie-style fight. And I said, I tweeted this after the fight. I said, the only difference between people like you and guys like Gaethje and Chandler is pretty much everything. <laughs> I I mean, uh, they're, 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 <laughs> there's very few people like these individuals that people yeah. don't understand yeah. the amount of toughness that it takes to withstand one of those shots. Right. It was 15 minutes of an absolute bar brawl between two of the best fighters in the world in their weight class. Ridiculous. A uh, pacing of lightweights with the power of potentially middleweights. Just thank you to those guys. It's yeah, just yeah, insane. Yeah. 
And and I tell you, I think uh, Chandler's just his enthusiasm and his antics. Just he really upped the ante of that fight. Like I've never seen him like that. You know what I mean? Where he's so engaged. Yeah. With every aspect of the fight, you yeah. know. And you know what I liked? I mean, and both in both fights too. The, you know, like I really at the beginning I said, man, I think Chandler's going to put this guy on his back, uh, and that the fight is going to be a rough night for him. But Man, I, he, the wrestling was, you know, kind of negated, which is crazy. On, you know, it just, I, I think it goes to show you how good Khabib is because right. he's getting you down. Like, there's no, I'm not getting you down. It's just yeah, so right, right. dominant, you and know. And, and these are high level guys, Kenny. I, I, I'm flabbergasted by that. I really am. I, it's mind boggling yeah. to me. He's, yeah, he's going to get that takedown. No matter what, I mean, there, and that, and that's what's intriguing about Chamayev because their dedication to getting the takedown. It's not like, oh, I'm going to try. I'm not going to expend any energy. If it's too much energy, I'll back out. No, they don't care. They're going to empty the They're gas. Ready. It's 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 a it's a, a live or die type of thing for them, and that's what you need at that level because everybody's like at the same pace. They Gaethje negated those takedowns easy. He wasn't going to do that yeah, with the other right. guy because right. that guy was that guy was going. He yeah. was uh, all eggs in one basket, you know, because yeah. I know guys, they don't want to exert themselves. Hey, maybe I didn't do the cardio. It just takes too much energy. Right. These other yeah. cats don't care, man. Yeah. This guy's lifting people up. He's having smoking a cigarette. He's having a conversation with somebody. Yeah. And he dumps you on your head. That's that's a different animal, man. It yeah. really is. So I'm, I'm excited to see how that plays out. But these two guys on this night were just absolutely yeah. – phenomenal yeah just i mean and entertaining i mean which is hard to do yeah uh they're both good friends i've professed a lot of love for gaethje on these airwaves right i have a fantasy football team that's called team gaethje full disclosure right um so and chandler is just a fucking savage too i mean they're just both absolutely incredible um i've never seen any fighter in my life quite like justin gaethje uh i think you both put it very well um but in terms of the division i think it's very interesting because ken flo you led with the fact if you are not a a master grappler slash wrestler uh you're in real trouble potentially against justin Gaethje. And I do think Chandler got to a point in the fight where he's like, all right, I'm probably not going to be knocked out concussively to the head. So uh, maybe I can knock him out. But, uh, you know, I'm making a, a very good about a, amount of money to show up tonight. And I'm one and two in the UFC, but I'm making a lot of money. I'm sort of liberated without the championship aspirations right now. And I know maybe Henry Hoof was a little bit frustrated that my guard wasn't tighter. But um, I think I think I think you know, in a lot of respects, Michael Chandler was trying to produce a hall of fame fight on Saturday night and mission accomplished in that area. But yeah. Kenny master grapplers of which Benil Daryush and Islam Akasha both are right. And so is Charles Oliveira, but not necessarily the type of guy who uh, can get you to the ground as easily right. as Islam can. Right. I mean, Islam yes. has all these layered trips and shit that just fucking yeah. get you there. And then he has so many different ways to keep you there. He'll take you right over to Habib, you know? Um, and I do think Gaethje doesn't cut a lot of weight to lightweight. Islam cuts a lot of weight. There's a size and strength thing. I think that's at play there that we certainly saw in the Habib fight. Um, so if you're Justin Gaethje, right? Like his whole thesis statement on this fight was set up a title shot, Ray. Right? So after the fact, he's like, you know, I needed to make sure that this night I produced uh, another opportunity for Trevor Whitman to win undisputed gold. And so what Justin Gaethje needs is either Gaethje or either Poirier, Kenny or Oliveira to emerge cleanly and to get his title fight. Justin Gaethje is the number one contender. He's going to get this opportunity. Um, Islam or Benil or whomever is going to be next. Um, but it's going to be Kenny Gaethje versus the Poirier uh, Oliveira winner on December 11th. And now I guess we just wait. But your thoughts on all that noise, if you would. Jeez. Well, and I think you make a lot of astute observations. I, I think it's an important point to say not only do they have to be a master grappler, they really have to be a, a master wrestler, right? Because he got to put Gaethje on his back. I don't think Oliveira is the guy to necessarily put him on his back. Oliveira is a slick striker and Gaethje has to be careful there. But as far as negating or taking away the submission advantage for Oliveira, Gaethje can do that by just defending the takedown and keeping it on the feet. And um, I think he matches up extremely well against Oliveira. I, I just think that the, the way that he fights and the way that Oliveira fights, I, I really like Gaethje's chances in that, which is why I think he's so adamant and why he's calling for that fight. Right, right. Dustin Poirier, of course, we've seen that fight. I think that would be another banger, so I, I wouldn't mind seeing that uh, again for sure. Uh, but Gaethje has put himself in this situation. I, I think he deserves it 
you look at the way he fights and, and what he's done for the UFC and, and the fighters that he's beaten, I, I think that's the next shot. Now, against a guy like Mahashev that you mentioned earlier, that's a tougher matchup just because of that damn wrestling that he possesses. He's, you know, uh, basically a clone of Habib with better striking. Hey, Ray. Yeah. Well, I like watching you adjust yourself there. That was fucking precious. All right. So uh, I'm going to throw out a few more names here. We got about four and a half minutes left with you. Right. Um, Wait, before, I really before have. You, before you go do ahead. it, go ahead. Go off to Trevor Whitman, man. Like I've had three decent guys night. fight on the same card. Had a but decent three night. Fights at those that magnitude. Right. I mean, the guys. That that guy's amazing, man. I think he's got the the right demeanor with his with his people. And holy crap, what a night that guy had. That's a that's a Hall of Fame night. Just that I night. I totally alone. agree. I totally you know? agree. He and, has and a the other thing with the other thing with Chandler being one and two. He that, look. This fight was close too. Very very close with him in the. Uh, yeah. He, no. He, he got a lot done. There's no doubt. You know what I mean. So he might be one and two, but man, I, this UFC has been a great fit for him, and uh, this this was an extremely close fight. So it's there's no there's no uh, loss there that means. No, of, anything. Course, of there, course. There was no loser in that fight. That's what I'm trying yeah. to say. Yeah. Both guys come out winners. There's a hundred percent not a loser and. Uh, Hats off to him, but that was it. Just, just to piggyback on the Whitman uh, comment for for Ray, yeah, an amazing night for him, and a coach who has developed three different style of fighters. You look at Usman; he's different from Gaethje, who's different from Rose. You know, I mean, they're they're all Incredible. different fighters, and he's been able to implement, you know, his philosophy on striking and integrate everything together in three different packages of of. of People who who may have the belt for you know a long time. Gaethje, of course, doesn't have the belt, but Rose and Usman, I could see them holding on to those belts for a very long time. Uh, and Gaethje's knocking on the door now too. So just an amazing job by by Whitman and, and that camp. Yeah, and I, he's I, so I think committed. It, it, it's his demeanor and personality. Because look, Usman is he did come up under Henry Hoof, so we got to give him sure. the credit too. You know what I mean? It's not right to to go right to that because he was already a developed fighter, a champion, but. To be able to be able to take somebody who's got a certain degree of ego at that point, he's used yeah. to one way of doing things. I think a guy like Trev is the perfect fit. He's soft spoken, you know. He's very humble, you know. It, he seems like just like a great guy. So yeah. I give him credit for that with his mind, you know. But I don't want to take away from Henry because he was with Henry for years, and unfortunately, Henry doesn't get I, to relish in, in the success that he has. I now. think that's I think that's absolutely valid, Ray. I, I think that's important, but I also think it's important to note. That Whitman has has taken Usman striking up a notch for sure. He, yeah. He's a much cleaner striker. His jab is way more developed. Um, but yeah, I, I, I agree. Hoof deserves a lot of credit yeah, there. Yeah. Well. Because I, lo I love Henry. I love all these guys. I Man, it was for me. It was great. I got to catch up with Mark Henry. I saw Trevor. He's just good guys, man, in the sport that yeah. really put their heart. And so I don't think people realize what the coaches go through, man. They got to balance a lot of egos. They got teams. They got yeah. guys wanting to do this, wanting to do that. It just, it's, it's yeah. not easy. So these are some really quality guys. When I get to talk to them, I really enjoy every second of it because, you know, we could, you know, everybody feels each other's pain. You know, like yeah. Mark's yeah. asking me like, like what the hell I'm even still doing. What am I doing? You know, I have no idea at this point. Yeah, but, right. We you know, really, yeah. You know, like I, I, want, I want to say another thing, like you know, because Re Volante retired. When we went out to eat, there's a picture. I think everybody put up. I'll put it up later. But we're all out at a, a really nice Italian restaurant. Emilio Bellato's. Give him a shout out. They did a great job, and everybody goes there. De Niro, any celebrity in New York goes there. Yeah. Um, but we were sitting there, man. I said, you know, at the table, I go, this is the end of an era, man. You know, it was Al, Weidman, um, Volante, Costa. Right. That was, you know, Aljo came a little later, but it's 14 years these guys have been fighting. You know, right. and I'm just, I want to say I'm proud of every one of them. You know, they all own multiple houses on Long Island. That's not easy to do, man. These yeah. are young kids. Yeah. They got a great start in life. But 14 years, the amount of damage you take and look, yeah. we had some laughs. We had some highs. We've had some lows, but I, I couldn't think of a, greater group of guys and just you know we Volante was never my guy but he was so close with Chris of he course. was always in the gym and just I want to wish him the best of luck he's going to do great as a coach and as a teacher and he's a he's a happy camper 
He really is. And he's going to do fantastic. And like, and these old guys had a great start. So nobody should feel bad for anybody, yeah. but it, it's, it is the end of an era for me and it sucks. And yeah. that's one yeah. era. There was an era before that. So this, like I'm in this thing, what, 25, 30 years now. I don't know. You know, it's getting a little wacky, but you can't get out. Now? Right. We got you but, for life, kid. Yeah. You know, when you start losing those guys that you've been with for 14 years and you think all the good things you went through, people's problems you had to deal with and everybody just sticking together while you're being attacked by the media by this and the, it's just yeah. a, it's a great feeling i don't know I i'm glad that. i'm glad you took the time to throw that in there you know especially for john volante right who wanted to be in the nfl ends up kenny with 31 professional mma fights crazy and obviously it didn't go out the way he uh he didn't go out the way he wanted to but uh just one of my favorite people on the roster over the years i remember talking to him uh in places like brazil and other spots and uh real quickly and i know you got to go and we got to get to aaron um but in terms of trevor whitman's humility and any man's humility right it's easy to sit here and say like oh i don't have an ego right but you need evidence and for trevor whitman how about the fact that he gave up his commentary job right how many coaches in mma want that dean thomas seat on the ufc telecast right and trevor whitman gave Gave it up. Now, there are myriad reasons he gave it up, one of which was his commitment to his athletes, right? How many people give up that seat, right? Yeah. For the money or otherwise. So I think that just speaks to how humble he is. And I couldn't be happier for that man. And I think a lot of people in the public eye feel misunderstood, right? And feel like people say, oh, maybe you're cocky or maybe you're not humble. And it's like, for a lot of these people, they are like beacons of humility. And Trevor Whitman oh, is very much yeah. that. Um, all right. Hey, have a great day and a better evening and all that stuff. You got anything else before we let you go? I mean, the former Ring of Combat champ, John Volante, is on the way out. Um, I don't celebrate long-go losses, right? Like, I yeah. love Raging Ally at Quinta. Like, no, we're not looking for New Yorkers to, like, break through and win UFC championships. Like, go over to share as a New England guy, you know, world champion. We yeah, love yeah, it. Yeah, but. Yeah. But 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 uh, the East Coast had a rough night. But listen, before I go, ha Billy Q. I mean, oh, how big is this guy's heart? I what mean, what? Yeah. I mean, holy crap! That yeah, was that yeah. was right out of Monty Python when they chopped the guy's leg. I got another leg. Like yeah. he didn't yeah. give a shit, man. Yeah, yeah. what a, another great a honey kid. Badger. Yeah, yeah, you know, great kid. I hope they took care of him because no, he Dana said as other, much at the yeah, post fight press conference. He was going to take care of him and Shane. Yeah, on any other fight card, that's the fight of the night. Yep. I mean, yeah, but, exactly. And you get yeah. followed up with that. And and the other thing is I hope Frankie's okay. Uh, yeah. It was a pretty vicious kick. He's yeah. another, Those guys are great guys. And, yeah. um, I hope that works out well for him. But that's yeah. it. Hey, much love. Thanks for giving us time. It's not an interview, okay? This is the Anakin <laughs> Florian wow. podcast. You You've had a Ray Longo minute for 300. That's how he sees us. Great that's shows. That's how he sees us. It's not an interview, okay? Hey Thanks. guys, any any time I'll I'll come on and interview. Anytime. I mean, when was the last time you got paid for an interview? <laughs> Wait for an interview. What was the last time I got paid for anything? <laughs> Cody, close, close I'm the window, fucking Rodney Dangerfield. <laughs> no, Rodney Dangerfield of podcasting at this point. Yeah, yeah. Are yeah. you kidding? Right, right. We pay Thank you God ten it. cents a t-shirt. Thank come God on. I put away a couple of shekels, Kenny, else I wouldn't have been able to do this. <laughs> The media mogul. You're the man, Ray. Take it easy, Thank guys. You. Matt Sarah was not at all happy with uh, the Ray Longo fight team sweatshirts. Literally didn't really? say hi to me. I haven't even told Cody this. Literally didn't say hi to me. Just uh, came right up and was like, this sweatshirt, you know, you make guys make me look like this, you know? And it's like, here's the deal, okay? <laughs> like, I don't know what your podcast is called, Matt Sarah. Don't know what it's called. Do not listen, right? I know it's sponsored by the UFC. <laughs> You know, I'm sure you guys do really well um, financially <laughs> and in other spots. Um, but I needed fight gear that didn't have your name on it. I didn't tell Cody to do it. You know, I don't know if that's you on the sweatshirt. I needed a Ray Longo fight team sweatshirt. And now I have oh, All right, man. now joining us. And we appreciate his patience as we're about four minutes tardy. Um, so glad to have this guy on the Mixed Martial Arts beat. I'm not sure what he would be doing if he wasn't ours, but Mixed Martial Arts reporter and content editor for TSN Sports, Aaron Bronstetter is with us on social media at Aaron Bronstetter. Great to see you, sir. How are you? Hey, thanks for having me on for the broadcast. Appreciate it. Looking forward to next week. Say that again. You cut out a little bit. Oh, is my mic cutting out? Yeah, the mic's cutting out. So we'll wait. We'll make sure we get. How's this? How's how's the? Uh... Yeah. There we is go. There we go. A B. All right. I'll get rid of my high tech equipment. We'll go off. Uh, we'll go off the uh, the phone mic.
There we go. It's great to see you, brother. So, uh, so you said Monday was a good day for you. I'm always curious after you get off a live event like that. Um, do you get a chance to uh, decompress? As as you can see, I kind of got to hit the ra- the ground running. Tuesday, I'll I'll take a deep breath. But um, obviously, we're right into another fight night this weekend, as I'd imagine you are too. Yeah, I usually take Mondays off uh, when I come home from travel. But you know, you guys asked me to be on the show, and that that's important to me, of course. So. Here I am, and I'm happy to join you guys. You know, I'm, I'm back at home, three kids, so, uh, you know, the grind never ends. You, you get off that plane, and you're right back to your other job. How old are your kids? Three kids. Good for you. I got uh, Last week, my oldest turned 11, my youngest turned three, and I've got a, a five-year-old in the middle. All right. Youngest is three, so he's got 15 years until they're all out of your hair. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just counting down the days. i got a timer up in my kitchen. It's like a digital <laughs> right. Yeah. How many, how many more hours I have left? So I said to my twin brother, I know you've been on Remember the Show with Bilal Muhammad, and I know they're going to get you back on. But I was like, hey, should we should we book Aaron Bronstetter on the Anakin Florian pod? He's like, yeah, why would you not book him? You know, it's like he's fucking I better. Agree than you guys, I you agree with them. I agree with them. That's that's a great point by them. So, uh, <laughs> right. Well, so and we re- we went right to it. So um, so how much traveling have you been doing? Where do you live and uh, how have you navigated sort of the pandemic as a reporter that I know would like to be live and at events as much as possible? Well, I'm in Toronto. This was actually my first trip back uh, since the pandemic. So it's been about 20 months since I've traveled for a UFC event. And, oh, wow. you know, I don't get nervous doing interviews on site and talking to the fighters. But the first day that I was coming back, I was in my hotel room saying, am I going to be any good at this anymore? You know, like I haven't done it in a while. And then Michael Chandler stepped in front of me. I'd never met the guy, but I've, I've spoken to him many times in the past. It was just like riding a bike. I just got right back into my stride. And it's just so great to be back uh, in person with all these athletes because the, the Zoom interviews for 20 months, it just got so redundant. Like you could have told me I was talking to like the Pope tomorrow on Zoom. It would have been like any other interview. It's just like, okay, well, what time? It's what, Tuesday at 545? Okay, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, I, I wasn't getting out of bed. Uh, excited to do interviews on Zoom anymore. But uh, being on location again was just, it was such a breath of fresh air. So I was happy to be back on the ground. Part of the reason I asked that question was because I hadn't seen you with boots on the ground in a while. And I know the Canadian landscape has been a little bit challenging to navigate. Well, that's good. Um, picked up right where you left off. So I saw a tweet uh, that you had about this Justin Gaethje, Michael Chandler business. And we talked about it a little bit earlier, um, but almost as if to say like this might have been Gaethje's third or fourth best fight in his career. And, you know, I've capped his fights on the air by saying, have you ever seen anything like Justin Gaethje? I have not. And. Chandler is like right there with him. Um, what did you make of that fight? And uh, I don't know if it's time to give it historical context, but a lot of people are trying to do that too. Well, yeah, I was saying it's one of the front runners for fight of the year, and it's probably Justin Gaethje's third or fourth best fight, like you mentioned. You know, like I, I don't think that fight was as good as the Poirier fight. I don't think it was as good as the Alvarez fight. And I think the Michael Johnson fight, just for, for as long as it lasted, was more exciting. Crazy. But man, that was still oh, an incredible fight. Nice. Like I was there and I was on the, the edge of my seat. And uh, it was awesome. And I was one of the very few people that said I thought that fight was going to go to a decision just because these are two elite fighters in a three-round fight. And it almost ended a couple times in the first, but uh, it did end up going the distance, which I think a lot of people were surprised by. But, yeah, I just think Justin Gaethje, to me, is the pound-for-pound most exciting fighter to ever do it. Like, you just know that when he's entering the octagon, you're going to get something special. He has not had a single boring fight for his entire I mean, his entire UFC career, but also his entire MMA career. His fights in the World Series of Fighting were unbelievable as well. Yeah, like who would be the most offended guy if you said Gaethje is the most exciting fighter in MMA history? If you're in a, if you're a fighter out there and you're offended, you can hit us up at Anik Florian Pod. You know, like who's the 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 number two, Aaron? You know what I mean? Like, because I think a lot of us give Gaethje that perch. Uh, I don't know. Interesting conversation. I think it's Fedor. Like I was thinking, the other person that came to mind for me was Fedor in terms of just guys that you know when they're in there, it's going to be an exciting fight because Fedor, yeah. his fights always end in like weird, in weird ways, in, yeah, that's in crazy true. ways. That they're always very frenetic. So I, I would put him at number two just in terms of sheer entertainment value. I'd put him probably at number two. I'm, I'm sure there are others that I'm missing. I mean, I felt terrible for Shane Burgos because Shane Burgos was like probably a top 10 exciting fighter also. Yeah. And he had to fight right after those guys. Right. And that fight, I, I said, would 95% of the time, that's the fight of the night. Oh, we're just going to skip. Cartillo. We're just going to skip over Tank Abbott, huh, guys? That's what we're going to do. We're just going to forget about Tank <laughs> yeah. Abbott and yeah. all his. Okay. Right. 
<laughs> right. oh, oh. I mean, that is a good point. Tank out. Abbott was going in there, flatlining guys with one big shot. <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah, it was that was a long completely time ago, but... different era. Okay. Right. Yeah, yeah. totally no, different era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, right, because the emotions that I had in 1993 at 15 years old watching Hoist Gracie <laughs> is like nothing I've ever seen in my life. Right. So. Um, all right. So I wanted to get Ken Flo's thoughts on this as well. Uh, TSN's Aaron Bronson are with us here on the Anakin Florian podcast. So the comparisons between George St. Pierre and Kamara Usman, um, people just can't help themselves. And I sometimes talk in absolutes and want to have conversations about legacies that are incomplete. And Kamara's is certainly that, right? So you can compare Kamaru to Habib, right? Habib's is done at 13 and 0 in the UFC and Kamara's already 15 and 0. But you've outlined a lot of statistics, obviously, on social media between these two guys. And I, Kenny is a former teammate of George St. Pierre, so we'll get his thoughts on the other side. But how do you compare these guys in terms of, uh, you know, their primes and when they're at their peak? Like, who's the better guy? Yeah, you know, I put those stats out. And I got the people that were, thought it was Usman saying, oh, these are biased stats. And then the people that thought it was George saying, oh, these are biased stats. Right, right. Saying, I'm just Both putting out data. I, I added zero context to it whatsoever. It was like a side-by-side -side thing. And man, it makes it really difficult to come up with an answer because, you know, George was so dominant and he didn't really have a Colby Covington in his career. I mean, the closest thing was probably Matt Serra, where like you need to see a rematch to really determine who won that fight. George was just, and I mean, Kenny, you were fighting during George's era and you trained with George. Like, you know how special of an athlete George St. Pierre is. And, and, I mean, you look at some of the scorecards, like 50-43 against John Fitch. If like if you were watching back then, John Fitch was a destroyer who oh. wouldn't give people a second to breathe, would smother them for three rounds, and would make them look like a child fighting a man. And George did that to John Fitch. You know, the, the problem is we live in, in a world of recency bias where you look at what Kamaru Usman's doing and you see how dominant that he is, and you see him beating Colby Covington. People make this point, like Colby Covington would have beaten all the guys that George St. Pierre fought. Fair, but we're talking about two different eras where guys were specialists versus, you know, a lot more well-rounded mixed martial artists in today's world. So it's really hard to make that comparison. Um, you, you know, it, it's it's funny. When Kamaru won the Ultimate Fighter, Faraz Zahabi was at TSN, I think it was like that the, the day after or the next week, with Rory McDonald. And I said to Fraz, this guy just won the ultimate fighter. And he, rhymed, he reminds me of George. Like I, I have a feeling about this guy and I might, that might be the, the best prediction I've ever made in the history yeah. of making predictions yeah. uh, because it's wrong through it's, you know, it's rang true with just how dominant Kamaru has been. And uh, I don't really have a good answer for who the better uh, right. welterweight right. of all time is. I and either. I think that that just speaks volumes about Kamaru being a top five all time guy, because a lot of people put George as a top three all time guy. Kenny, I want to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, the John Fitch name, I think, is an important one to inject into this conversation because, I mean, that dude kept me up at night, you know, like just in terms of, man, like, what would I do if I ever got locked in a space with someone <laughs> like that, you know? Um, so I don't know. I don't know that there's a great answer. I mean, certainly title defenses are the number one consideration for me, and George has more of those right now. Um they never fought each other, so we're never going to get a clear answer. But what do you think right. about these two legacies and these two guys and all the, the comparisons that are out there? Yeah, listen, I, I think the other interesting thing to kind of talk about was that, you know, both these guys had very different trajectories and di very different paths to their championship reigns. I think Camaro, when you look at his first 10 fights, right, um, you know, didn't have the strongest strength of schedule, okay? Uh, you look at George St. Pierre's first 10 fights, it's like, Carl Parisian's in there. Matt Hughes is in there. Um, and, and then we talk about who George beat to become a, a champion. Matt Hughes, who was at the time the most dominant UFC champion that they've ever had. Um, you know, so then he went out there and dominated him, then beat him again, um, you know, which is really impressive. Then, of course, you talk about all his title offenses. I don't think Usman is there yet. OK, and, and clearly it's a different error the 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 strength of schedule now that he's faced over the last 10 fights or the last seven fights or whatever um, it, it is a higher level uh, in a lot of ways. Right. That there's the fighters are so much more well schooled. They're way more experienced. Um, so that is very different. Usman is on his way. I, I'm not ready to say he's the best welterweight champion yet. Um, but again, George St. Pierre is in front of him. The guy who I think is the greatest of all time, never had any controversial, you know, drug tests or things that, you know, yeah. Oh, you know, so there's nothing that is really smearing his name there. Um, you know, ha had, had a, um, 
and, and any losses that he had that maybe were big upsets, like the one against Matt Sarah, he was able to go and get, get, um, you know, revenge. And so I don't know. And, and as far as uh, name power, George St. Pierre, one of the biggest champions that we've had, one of the biggest names we ever had. And he did in an era where, I mean, do you, do you, Maybe in the Bisping fight, but was there ever a time he ever heard George St. Pierre say anything bad about his opponent or ever talk crap? He yeah. did it the old-fashioned way, and he did it little by little yeah. over time. It became, you know, the, the biggest name in the sport. I guess Brock Lesnar might have been a bigger name, but yeah. right there with him. So, yeah. uh, But Usman's absolutely on his way. He's been yeah. so impressive. Different trajectories. Two amazing fighters. AB, you think Kempo's got love for George St. Pierre at all? I mean, <laughs> geez, <laughs> man. Okay, I'm fine. <laughs> Who doesn't have love for George Sanchez? No, I mean, of the guy, course. like you mentioned, was such a gentleman. And you look at the guys that he beat, I think every single one of his UFC fights would have been against a top five guy. Listen, I mean, the division was a lot smaller back then. This was a growing sport at the time. But you mentioned Caro Parisian, and that was his UFC debut. Parisian was like a title contender at that right. point in time. Like people thought that he was one of the, the guys that was going to be a longtime champion in the sport. And George, I looked at the stats today, and I think it was like 26 significant strikes to one in that fight or something along those lines. Like George just completely embarrassed Caro Parisian. Who, again, like if you go back to then, I think a, a lot of people like Caro was a young monster who a lot of people thought was going to be the champion. Right. So, again, a lot of it is about context. A lot of it is you're trying to argue with people that that haven't watched the sport for as long that, that didn't watch George's rise and his uh, his championship years with, with the same lens as what they see with Usman right now. And I mean, yeah. hey, on the flip side of that, I think Usman is fighting the far more well-rounded guys. He's got a lot more guys in the division because there are a lot more people fighting now. Like the UFC yeah. is such so much bigger. So the talent pool is still huge for him to face and he's fighting like guys like um, Gilbert Burns and, and uh, of course, Covington twice. Masvidal, like these guys are just absolute marauders, right? So it's not like he's uh, having any right. cupcakes in his, uh, you know, in, in his resume. So it, it's what makes it such a difficult question because we've seen George lose twice. And we've just never yeah. seen, unless you watched Usman's whatever second professional right. fight, we, we haven't seen Usman lose. So right. it's, it's hard for us to look at it through the same lens. And we've seen George nearly lose and come back and win, get kicked in the head by Carlos Condit. And and had that been an L, uh, obviously that would have changed his legacy. And like he won that round. To, yeah, <laughs> right. right. Won that that's round. Not the fight, right. And Kamaru <laughs> really hasn't had that moment. I mean, there wasn't a singular time in this fight over the weekend that it felt like he got hurt or wobbled, really, even though Kobe landed some big shots. And the UFC 245 fight, the ability for Kamara to take those shots was just insane. Like, man, he's incredible. Uh, and so is George, obviously. And uh, it's an interesting conversation. Um, so what's like your favorite sport other than mixed martial arts? Like, do you watch a lot of sports on TV? Like me, I got three kids. I never watch TV sports or otherwise, really, if it's not the UFC. Like, what do you what do you what do you watch? You a hockey guy? No, I, I was never really a hockey guy. You know, I, when I first started uh, getting into journalism, I wanted to cover basketball. I was so into basketball. But now there are so many games that I can't keep up with it at all. Like, if, if you ask me to name 10 players on, like, a, a specific team, I probably wouldn't be able to do it now. But back then, I used yeah. to be able to rail off their stats. I used to be able to tell you, um, you know, what, what number they were drafted, where which college they went to. Like, I was really into uh, basketball when I first got into journalism. I'd say now my second favorite sport is the NFL. Like it's, a, it's a lot more palatable to just watch a bunch of games on a Sunday on red zone right. and follow right. along. And I'm in many fantasy football leagues. So, uh, that would probably be the only other sport that I follow fairly closely. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, like you mentioned, it's just because the mixed martial arts schedule is year round and we put so much time into this. Um, you know, I, I understand that people don't have kids or whatever. They can probably, uh, you know, watch a lot of sports whenever they want to in their leisure time. But with three kids, it's, you know, no rest for the wicked. I just love it. Like if you're a red blooded man or woman, how do you not like American football? You know, like you're, you're <laughs> too smart an individual to not like American football. You know, well, it's amazing. To... It, you know, the NFL is such a fun sport. I mean, and then when you watch, when, when you are watching it through, uh, you know, when you're thinking about your fantasy team, like yesterday was such a disaster for me, like, and, and, yeah. and a disaster for so many favorite, like if you were in suicide leagues, yesterday was not oh. a good day for you in, yeah. in all likelihood. It was a bad one. I got a fantasy team that's 0 and 8, you know. But oh, I used to have geez. a lot of UFC fans, like European fans, ask me, like, hey, I want to get into the NFL. Give me a team to root for. And I never gave them the New England Patriots because I felt like it was too much of a front runner, you know, like it was like Man City, like when I started right. following and Man City. I don't really <laughs> have a, a, a team either in the NFL. Like, I just love the sport. Like, yeah. I, I love 
I, I, I always like kind of cling on to certain players. Like I was a Chargers fan for a time because I thought LaDainian Tomlinson was the greatest player I'd ever laid eyes on. He was so good. But, uh, you know, like I, I don't really hitch myself to any wagon because I feel like you're, you're setting yourself up for disappointment like 95% of the time. Yeah. If you, if you cheer for one team. I mean, unlike you, who's a Patriot fan who just gets to live the highs of life and, and you know, ride high all the time. Yeah. You know, imagine being like a Bills fan or like a, I mean, like a Jaguars fan or a Lions fan would probably be the worst oh. of all of them. I mean, it's just, it's just year after year of just gut, gut-wrenching disappointment. I don't, I don't know how people live like that. I can tell I'm 43 because I have a, a place in my heart for Jets fans, right? Like they needed this quarterback, Zach Wilson, that they just drafted to be better than Mac Jones, the guy the Patriots drafted. And that does not appear uh, to be the case. But as I tell but, my but kids, Mike, they, Mike White is better than Mac Jones, though. Mike White yeah, is right. the, the, yeah. the greatest Mike star White's in the NFL. Right good. Now. You're right. He's just hucking the ball. It reminds me of um, what's the name of the backup quarterback on the uh, the Bears and, and what he did. I'm not sure, not the Bears, the Browns. Um, Case oh, Keenum, Case like Case Keenum, Keenum yeah. at, at Houston, where he was throwing like 400 yards a game and like passing 65 right. times. Yeah. Like that's that Mike White's bringing that to the NFL. It's a lot of fun to watch. Yeah, I just tell my kids, honey, it's just the Patriots have the best head coach. You know, <laughs> that's what I just tell them about Bill Belichick. I've been ending interviews, like lower profile interviews, during UFC 268 Fight Week. Probably shouldn't admit this on the air, um, <laughs> but I'll wrap up an interview in you know Wisconsin, right? And they'll be like, "All right, thanks for joining us, John. Have a great call this weekend. We'll talk to you soon." I'll be like, "Thank you, guys, man. I appreciate you having me on. Bill Belichick's the best. We'll talk to you soon." Because like, <laughs> oh, everybody hates him, you know. Everybody <laughs> hates him. It's like, okay, you know. I would never have done that when I'm 33. Now I'm 43 and I don't care as much. Um, all right. Rapid fire questions with my man, Aaron Bronstetter on the way out. All right. So the last time I stood on a block to do an interview was when I interviewed Brock Lesnar at the ultimate fighter training center 10 years ago, 2011, when I had just started with the UFC. No, this might've been for MMA live in like 2008 or 2009. So I go up to do the post fight show this weekend and I see them going for the fucking block. You know, because I'm on set with Anthony Smith, Chael Sonnen and Michael Eves, and they're all six foot or more. Like I'm not five, six Rosendo Sanchez. I'm five, nine. So I'm not, I have no problems with my height. Like I'm very comfortable with my height until I see them going for the block. I didn't accept the block. I looked kind of foolish on TV. I acknowledged it on camera (laughs) because I felt like I had to. Have you ever stood on a block to interview a subject? I haven't, but I've had Stipe Miocic crouch down for an interview. I don't know if that counts. Oh, right. It was after he beat Francis. And I remember this vividly because it was one of the hardest interviews I've ever had to do. Because while I was interviewing Stipe, blood started trickling out of his ear, like down the side of his face. And I had to not focus on that while I was talking to him. Yeah. But it was just like he was smiling. He was having a good time. Yeah. He had just overcome the odds. Everybody thought Francis was going to win. Yeah. And uh, he was crouching down right next to me. So his ear was like at eye level with me. And yeah. just blood started streaming, streaming down the side of his ears. That's why I remember that so vividly. But I have never stood on a block for an interview. Good. Yeah. Try to avoid that fate. Steep A. How tall are you? Five nine. Right? Five, yeah, five, five nine. Also. Five nine. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why I wear high tops though, like around around UFC headquarters, you know, get a little inch where I can. Um <laughs> all right. What is the city of birth on your birth certificate? Toronto. All right. So when, when, so that's good, right? Because like sometimes people say, Oh, where are you from? Right. You say, Oh, I'm from Boston. Right. And they say, Oh, well, Mm -hmm. where are you from? I was like, well, I'm from the Metro West area, but my birth certificate says Boston, Massachusetts, because I was born in the 1970s. And when you lived in Natick, probably in 1978 and you were having a baby, you had to go into the fucking city, the Boston lying in hospital. So I was born in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm from fucking Boston, Kempflo city of birth for you. Uh, let's see. I was living in Westwood, but I think the hospital I was born might've been Boston. All I right. To... We get, let's get that answer yeah. for the listenership I'm, I'm next week. All right. Yeah. Uh, AB worst sport to watch on television. Oh, well, people are probably going to hate this answer, but it's gotta be baseball. Like baseball's so boring. Yeah, and I right. mean, there are, I don't know how people watch 162 games of baseball a year. Like one game of baseball is enough, is enough for me, is painful enough for me. 162 <laughs> games people watch of baseball every year. I don't, I don't know. Like the, the thing about MMA is it's such an ADD sport. There's so much going on and basketball too. Like I, I watched basketball and basketball's like, oh, so you go down the court, pass, score, go down the, go down the, the court, pass, score. Baseball's like, man, we've got 14,000 right. in attendance today. Yeah, man. This, this, uh, pitching uh this, this picture is uh, brought to you by nathan's hot dogs and it's a uh, 78 degrees outside today that, that's the hardest job ever calling baseball oh, filling all on that. radio must oh. be the most difficult because there's like a pitch every like two minutes vince and Scully, here's the line I'm... broadcaster of all time i i yeah, don't know how he filled all those gaps without an analyst absolutely incredible yeah i challenge people on the baseball front forget an inning forget a game 
put your phone down, watch an at bat. See if you can get through an at bat, at bat without looking at your cellular telephone. Um, all right. If you could pick one sports team, I know you don't seem to have a dog in the NFL fight. You don't like hockey, which uh, you shouldn't admit to loudly on the streets of Toronto. Uh, if you could pick one sports team to win a title next, who would it be? Well, the Raptors just won one, but I'd t- probably take the Raptors again. That's the only team I've really ever had any real investment right. in is the Raptors because they they the franchise came about when I was like in my formative years, right? That's when it came to Toronto in 1995. So, uh, you know, that's really the only team I've ever had any sort of real emotional investment in. And they've won the championship recently, so I'm, I'm happy about right. that. But so I wouldn't mind seeing them get another chip. You're good. No, I like that. All right. And uh, last question. You don't have to tell me which one. Do you have a favorite child of the three? <laughs> no, I don't. I think about it all the time. Do you ever do you ever have that weird Sophie's Choice thing where like if somebody said like you have to like kill one of your kids, who's like you have to I'm going to kill one of your kids and you have to choose which one. Do you ever have that like crazy thought? Not that one. I mean, I certainly think I have about that all the time. The favorite, I had it today. But... I had it earlier today. I remember. Man. And thinking like, I don't know what I would do. I'd have oh, to like man. tell them to kill yeah. me and then just kill one of them after because I wouldn't be able to live with myself. Yeah. I don't chosen know. One of them. Yeah. I would have, I mean, to, I'd have, have to be like, to take me you. and then you, whatever you want to do from there is up to you. I'll have to get back to you on that one, but I do have a favorite kid, <laughs> depending on the day and when you ask me. Um, oh yeah, but that's not the that, no no that's not a fair answer. Depending on the day, of course. Yeah, no, well, the, the kid that's the, the kid that's not uh, giving me a hard time that day is my favorite kid for sure. Right. But you know, I don't right. have a an overall favorite. I don't have power rankings. I do see that's the thing, and it's like <laughs> I think, but you're not you you are honest, right? You answered so quickly that even if you were hooked up to a lie detector, where some people would say they don't have a favorite kid, if you have a least favorite kid or a kid that annoys you more than the other kids, then that means that one of them is probably uh, a peg up. But um, it's great to have you on, my man. I mean, let's maybe try to work you back in here uh, in the not too distant future. If you want more from Aaron Bronstetter, and candidly, if you are a mixed martial arts fan and you're not following this guy the people's reporter. I don't know what you're doing. Uh, It's at Aaron Bronstetter, TSN Sports. Appreciate your time, brother. And uh, I will see you on the road soon. Good to have you back there on the, uh, on the streets. Hey, my pleasure. If you want to do the Bronstetter minute, I'll I'll just jump on it after Ray Longo every week. (laughs) It sounds good to me. Yeah. He took four of your minutes today, so we'll have to talk to him. Thank you, buddy. Well, he owes me. I'll I'll let him know next time I see him. That's good. See you you guys. Thank you. Aaron Bronstetter with us on the Anakin Florian podcast. Cody, I don't want to keep Krause waiting, but we do have a pronunciation of the week. I should have asked Aaron Bronstetter about it, um, but I would like to get this man's name out there on the airwaves. Um, hey, Cody. Hey, what's up? Well, I can't go to Long Island, so I'm, I got plenty of time to look up pronunciations, you know? I'm afraid for my life. So I believe this man, he's a Fortis MMA light heavyweight, and he is fighting in the first fight of the night against a guy in Daun Jung who has been absolutely terrific in the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Um, this is the first fight of the night. How do you pronounce first name Kennedy, last name? Who is this Fortis MMA guy? I figured you had Kennedy down. Kennedy and Zechiku? All right, let's hear him say it. Oh, Jesus. Kennedy and Zechiku. Kennedy and Zechiku. No, I feel like I've watched this guy like six times. I think he had it. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah. play the first change. Just play the first one real quick. Yeah, that's it, right? So I walked up to him and I'll never forget safe. So it was right there. I said, Kennedy and Zechiku. And he's like, oh, that sounds great. I'm like, yeah, but is it right? You know, Um, forget about when he slows it down. We got that right. All right. It is time to make some picks, and then I promise we will circle back to UFC 268 on the backside. But um, we have got an incredible, truly incredible UFC Fight Night main event coming up this weekend. Let's get to the main event challenge. It's the main event challenge. And it. The time is most definitely now. I finished fights. I'm going to do everything possible to win. The main event challenge. The John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. I mean, this guy just making people money. I mean, you come on here. You make your podcast debut. Your best bet's Bobby Green. You're about as convicted as you could possibly be. He's minus 170, right? So it's not like you're giving out some minus 300 favorite and people only had to wait two and a half minutes, not even uh, to cash those tickets. So, I mean, the floor is yours, man. Like I had my producer cut up the audio. Um, we're basically just, you know, getting down on our knees, kid. But it's great to see you great to see you back in the U.S., uh, and obviously, you were pretty sharp last week. Uh, yeah, I feel pretty good about that one. You know, it's this just like in everything, people need to understand that this stuff goes in waves, right? So it's like, I about about two months ago for like a, a sixty day span, I don't think I could miss. But this last month has been a roller coaster. It's been right. it's been off and on. But 
starting last week. I think I think I think I'm out of the tunnel now. So I feel pretty good. Uh, this I will say this: this card is a little tough. It's a little it's a little tough tougher in my opinion. This last card I really I really liked. I did really well. I liked a lot of the picks. Um, yeah. I felt good about Bobby, obviously. Bobby is so, I'm telling you, I fought Bobby. Like, I, I know Bobby really well. And I've been watching him fight for a long time. The dude is really, really fast. Um, he's hard to hit clean. And I just feel like with, uh, stylistically matches up really well against like a single shot fighter. You know what sure. I mean? Like, you got to have some good mobility. And 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 if, you, if Al's predominantly a boxer, and Bobby's Bobby's got really good underrated boxing. Unbelievable. Last 10 fights had gone the distance and Bobby King Green, two minutes and 25 seconds. I didn't see that. I didn't yeah. see that. Yeah. All right. So Ken Flo, five and two on the evening. If you put $100 on every one of Ken Flo's predictions, you would have won $600. James Krause, also five and two. Uh, and if you put $100 on all of James' predictions, you would have won $543. So uh, you guys made the listeners some money, and we spin it forward here. Miguel Baeza, minus 145. Chaos Williams, plus 125. Good welterweight matchup here. I love both of these guys. Baeza coming off his first pro loss. It came to Santiago Ponzinibbio in June. Williams had a win over the very tough Matthew Semmelsberger by unanimous decision. Same month. James Krause, pretty evenly priced and matched up here minus 145 and plus 125 you going Baeza or uh or chaos williams <clears throat> this is typically one of those fights i like to stay away from to be honest with you yeah. uh and and you can like i'm curious to the line do you have the line on uh chaos by knockout we'll try to chase that for you sometimes the propositions come later in the week and by the yeah. way we do you no favors you and kenny making you make your picks on monday we know that so no it's okay it's okay so this is a fight where like i feel like Miguel Baeza is for sure the better fighter, but they don't call him chaos for no reason. You know what I mean? Like the dude has just a truck of a right hand. And uh, so like this would be a fight where you could go, you could go uh, uh, Baeza straight up. And really the odds aren't that bad on that. You know, you could go, you could, you could go uh, Baeza straight up and then you could hedge with chaos by knockout. And I, I don't know the lines. It'd, it'd be really hard for me to tell you the lines, yeah. uh, but I feel like there's a, there's a small in-between play in there that you're, you're probably going to win some money. I like Miguel Baeza in this fight. I'm really high on this dude. Uh, he's really good, very complete fighter, good boxing. However, he can be a little hittable, which scares me against a guy like uh, like Chaos Williams. So I, if you have a gun to my head, I'm going to pick Baeza because yeah. I feel like he's the better, more com complete fighter that has more tools to win this fight. However, Chaos has that right hand, and he and he throws it with no load, and it is abs it's a nightmare to come at you. So yeah. Uh, Depending on what the lines are there, you know, I'm, I'm going to go just for the show. I'll pick Baeza, but man, I wouldn't, I don't feel great about it. You know what I mean? Like chaos is a guy that can finish anybody. I think it's a good handicap, Ken Flo, honestly. I mean, I can tell the listeners I would lay off. I would not be betting this fight. Uh, under two and a half right now is juiced to minus 125, but the chaos Williams knockout prop uh, is not up at least right now. Ken Flo, Baeza, Williams uh, forced to choose or otherwise, which way are you going? Yeah, listen, I think that was a great breakdown. Um, I, I also think Baeza has more ways to win uh, in, in this fight as well, right? Um, I, I think he's a far superior grappler to Williams. I think that's going to be his approach or should be his approach in this fight. Can he strike with Williams and be technical and, and get some shots in? Yes, but as James said, you trade too much with someone like Williams, and if you get complacent and you stay in that pocket for too long, you will be sleeping. And that's where Baeza really needs to be careful, needs to use his long range weapons in this fight. And if it does get into that close range, hit that takedown, put Williams on his back. So uh, I like ba Baeza here as well. I, I see a lot of potential in this kid. All right, next up at middleweight, Kyle Dawkins, minus 225. Roman Delidze stepping in here, plus 185. Dawkins, one and two with a no contest in the UFC. Kind of seems a little bit unfair given how well at times he has fought. Um, two tough guys here. I know that maybe isn't saying much in the UFC, but these guys are both really tough and have proven as much. Um, this was going to be the Dawkins Holland rematch. Uh, it'll be Delidze instead. James, he's nine and one overall, coming off a win over Lauriano Starpoli in June. So I thought Dawkins would be minus 175. Like I write down what I think the odds are going to be beforehand. He's minus 225. I think that's pricey. Uh, what do you make of this fight? And ultimately, which way are you going? Man, you just, you just hit it right on the head. If you're asking me who uh, who I'm picking to win the fight, I like Dawkins for sure. But I do think it's a little I think it's a little expensive here. Uh, once again, I know the props come out a little bit later. But the, I like the over in this fight. Both these guys are really, really good grapplers. I don't see either one of these. They're Both of them favor the grappling. 
Both of them have really good striking as well, but I think both of them are slightly better grapplers than they are strikers. Uh, and I do see this. I do see this being a grappling match to 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 some degree. Um, I don't think either one of them is going to submit the other. So uh, I, I like the over in this one, depending on what the price is. But if, if you're asking me who I'm picking, I'm for sure picking Dawkins. But if you're asking me if I like the line, the answer is absolutely not. I think yeah. I definitely think you're right on that. I think it's a little overpriced. Kempflow, Dawkins, Delidze, which way are you going? It's interesting. Delitze has a very similar background to me. He played soccer, then went into jujitsu, then started his MMA career around 28 years old. So, um, you know, I, I could definitely cheer for him, but I do like Dawkins here as well. I, I think he's a little bit cleaner with the striking. You know, I think the experience factor, uh, you got to count that as well. So I like Dawkins here. All right, co-main event at heavyweight. We'll take a round and a method of victory, if you'd be so kind. Ben Rothwell, minus 150. Marcos Rogerio de Lima, plus 130. The King of Kenosha is 39 and 13 in mixed martial arts. I know James Krause respects that total. He's won three of his last four. Pays out counters, having alternated wins and losses spanning his last 10. Last time out looked pretty good over 15 minutes against the crochet boss, Maurice Green. Co-headliner, Rothwell de Lima. Which way are you going, James? Uh, I got to go Rothwell here. Um, I, I'll be honest. I didn't. I, if I if I remember right, Rothwell's last fight is against Barnett, who just fought this last weekend. That's Nasty right. yep. uh, spinning wheel kick against yeah. uh, Volante. I didn't. I didn't really like the way he looked against uh, Barnett. I know Barnett's uh, deceivingly athletic, but I didn't think he looked great in that fight. Uh, now, when it hit the ground, Rothwell's grappling is pretty uh, underrated, in my opinion. And I, I think that'll be the the difference here if Rothwell decides to uh, decides to fight him smart. I think the grappling will make a big difference. Uh, I don't think Delima is going to be able to get Rothwell out. Rothwell's super durable, very very tough to submit, very very tough to knock out. I just see uh, I see Rothwell outlasting Delima here. I'm I'm going to go Rothwell by decision. I think he's got more ways to win. He's more well rounded, uh, and his cardio is better. Uh, Rothwell's one of those guys that has just made a living off of he's he just hangs around, you know, and he'll get a, he'll beat a lot of heavyweights just by hanging around. You know, and he's he's tough. You guys remember his fight against uh, Junior Dos Santos. Dos Santos beat the mess out of him. And uh, he's not going to go away. You're going to have to knock him like you're going to have to put him, you know, send him to the shadow realm to get him out of there. But he uh, I just don't see Delima being able to do that. I think I think Rothwell is going to hang around and find a way to win the rounds. Speaking of hanging around, Ken Flo, you called a lot of Pezow's early fights at the UFC. This guy knows how to hang around. I say that with all due respect. Um, still looking for that signature win and yeah. the two-fight winning streak that's going to get him to sort of divisional relevance. But uh, he's getting the co-main event showcase. He's getting his face on the poster. Or maybe not, given this main event. But uh, who do you have yeah. in the co-main, Ken Flo? Well, listen, I think this is a terrific opportunity for Marcus Rogerio de Lima to get a win over a true veteran uh, in Rothwell and, you know, um, get get some people behind him. But I just don't see it happening. Um, I, I agree with James here. Can't go the other way. I, I think that Ben, his experience, um, his ability to kind of uh, survive and bring it into the grappling realm, I, I think is going to be the difference here. Um, I could see him... Getting a TKO here, uh, you know, I, I need some extra points. I'll, I'll go with the TKO. Let's go TKO round three. Um, I think it will take him a little bit to get it done. Um, but I, I do see a weakness there in, in Delima's game. So let's go with Ben Rothwell TKO. Maybe he, he gets him on the ground and, and pounds him out. I think I'd rather kiss my sister than let Ben Rothwell put his hands around my neck for some like fucking go-go choke or something. Jesus that, what about that 10 finger? He's got a nasty 10 finger. He does. Routine. Yeah, exactly. Nasty. Yeah, I feel like I would like die. All right, main event. I'm so excited for this main event. Minus five ninety, James, on Max. No Holloway. way. Man. I mean, can we put some respect on Yair Rodriguez at plus four twenty five? All right, so a little bit of history for you before we get your predictions. Last fight for Yair, if my research is accurate, Jeremy Stevens, two thousand nineteen. He had the Zabit Magomed Sharipov fight go away. Then there was like a Usada whereabouts form issue that resulted in a suspension. Um, so that's part of the handicap. Certainly the layoff. There's no doubt. Yeah. Max Holloway, I'll just say, as somebody who has called fights for 10 years for the UFC, what he did against Calvin Cater without a recency bias in January is the singular greatest performance that I've seen on the feet live from that seat. Uh, just a historically great performance. And I think that is also reflected in the price here. But minus 590 is crazy given Yair's ability. What do you have for us, James, on the, uh, on the main event? Well, I mean... If you're anybody 
not named Alex Volkanovsky, it's really, really tough for me to bet on you against Max Holloway. I mean, even if your name is Alex Volkanovsky, I mean, right. Ma- right. Max is incredible, right. man. I mean, he's he's amazing, you know. Uh, and I, 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 I don't see Yair winning this fight. Uh, however, 590 is absolutely absurd. So, you know, I think I, I think from a from a betting perspective, we're always trying to find value, right? And once again, we don't know the lines right now, but I do feel like if you guys remember the fight with uh, uh, KZ against uh, Yair, I know Yair knocked him out, but if you remember right before that, KZ was on his way to to winning a a, a you know he was going to win a decision. I feel like it was pretty right. decisive. Uh, he was landing, he was finding the punches. And we're talking about Max Holloway. Listen, if you're going to fight Max Holloway, he's going to find you. Like, he's going to hit you. That's He's one of the best elite in the world. He is going to hit you. It's not a matter of if or what. He's going to find you. He's going to find you, right? So, like, Yair just gets a, hit a little hit, hit a little too much for my comfort. So, for me, the value play is going to be in, in – uh, in Holloway by TKO or knockout. I think that's going to be late. You know, it's over the course of five rounds. Holloway is, is the king of five rounds. I mean, his tank doesn't go anywhere. If anything, he picks up. Uh, I like this max by TKO. Uh, once again, it's all about value. So depending on where we, where we find sure. lines at, I don't see this going the distance. I don't. Yeah. Uh, and, and maybe even if we see something crazy like Yair by knockout, probably not going to happen right, right but man if the odds are plus 2000 it might right, be worth sprinkling right. something in on you know uh because sure. that's what we're trying to do right it's not necessarily about who we think is going to win or lose it's about trying to find value and i'm not i'm not putting minus 590 on max holloway here it's just that that line just doesn't make sense to me so right. i gotta try and i gotta try and find value elsewhere i don't think this fight is going five rounds so for me i'll probably look at that holloway by tko i might even look at yeah you're by tko just to just to see if you know what the what the line is on it. So it's all about value for me here. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go max by TKO. That's interesting. Yeah, if you're looking at Yaya Rodriguez inside the distance, even you're probably getting it at plus eight hundred, plus nine hundred or yep. so. And I will talk to our friends at DraftKings and try to see if I can get you some of those numbers, knowing that we do our show early on Monday. Because you're right. Uh, for a lot of people attacking this fight from a betting standpoint, uh, I mean, it's always it's, good to hedge, right? Like if if Yaya wins this fight, how is he gonna win? Right. Right. He's going right. to win by knock. He's not going to be right. Max Holloway in the decision. I think Over we all agree with that. Twenty-five minutes. Right? right. Yeah. Right. Right. So right. if we can, if we can put a hundred bucks down on yeah. on Yair at plus two thousand, hundred to win two thousand, it might be worth hedging on the other side to get that. Is it going right. to happen? Probably not. But you can almost guarantee yourself some money one here if you go Holloway. I don't even know about Holloway straight up. I just don't. For me, it's Holloway by TKO. Yeah, you're by TKO. That's the yeah. way you would play it yeah. if you want to hedge both sides. I, I mean, I don't know the lines yet, so obviously right. we obviously need, need to see the value here, but I don't see uh, Yeah, you're winning five rounds over yeah. Max Holloway. I just don't see it happening. Kempfla, what do you think about this main event? Back to the little UFC Apex this weekend. Uh, who do you have? Yeah, did, did James give a round on that one yet? Do you have a round? Oh, uh, no, I didn't. Let's go uh, four. Okay. TKO and four. Yeah. All right. So, all right, we're, we're, we're thinking on the, on the same wavelength uh, for this fight. Listen, I, I, I agree with a lot what James said. I, I think that as far as Holloway goes, he's as durable as they come. I think Yair has shown a lot of toughness as well, right? Uh, I think you got to watch out. First seven minutes against Yair Rodriguez, man, he, he's willing to throw anything and everything at you. So Holloway's going to have to be have to be careful, no doubt, early in this fight, but Holloway has seen a lot of things out there. And when he does his homework and he, his preparation over the last few years ha- have been uh, pretty perfect for the most part. You know, his rematch against Volkanovsky and Cater and all those things, his ability to stay busy. There's not a whole lot of people that are going to have the conditioning and output that Holloway can put on you. Um, his mental toughness, his chin, everything is just so damn impressive. He's improved as a grappler. You can't really take the kid down. Uh, and even on the ground, he's able to get back to his feet or be dangerous there as well. So for, yeah, for Yair, this is a very tough fight. And this would be a huge statement if he's able to oh. beat Holloway. Can he get it done? I don't think so at this stage. I, I, I think, listen, now here's the other thing. A lot can happen in two years and some change, okay? Uh, you know, a lot can happen. Maybe Yair's been putting in a lot of work, and he just comes out a completely different fighter. That is feasible. And that is possible. But against someone like Max Holloway, who has stayed active, um, I just don't see it happening. 
I, I like Holloway here as well. Let's go with a, a fifth round TKO just to be a little bit different. I, I was eyeing that fourth round as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's where the value is. Holloway could very well go out there and win a decision. Um, but I, I don't see too many people beating yeah, uh, but beating Holloway by decision these days. Uh, so I agree with James there. James, you back on the road this weekend. When's your next uh, wheels up? Of course you are. Yeah, Thursday. Yeah, <laughs> I got. Uh, I have two guys on uh, Dan White's looking for a fight. All right, my man. Well, uh, safe travels. We appreciate you squeezing us in, and uh, we will talk to you next week, brother. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Good work, dude. There he is on social media at the James Kraus. I'm really enjoying you two going head to head and um, we're going to figure out the scoring system and all that. I do like kind of the way we did it last week where uh, essentially, basically, you don't have to think about where you're putting your money, right? Like, and again, if people have feedback for our scoring system at Anna Florian Pub, but you don't have to determine I'm putting 500 bucks on this guy, right? We're just going to take your bets um, and put a hundred dollars on them, you know, straight or whatever. And, uh, and that's a good idea. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Before we get out of here, just a few final thoughts on UFC 268. Um, Shane Burgos really needed to win. I think Billy Corantello proved that he can hang with the top 15. This is a, a heartbreaking loss for Billy Q um, because you know, I do think Shane Burgos, at least right now, is the better fighter. And I think Billy Q thought going in that he was the better fighter. And Billy Q has every skill in the book and great cardio and everything else. I, I just think Burgos came on too strong. Um, I don't know if you have anything for us on that fight um, before we get to Cheeto. But um, I'm, I'm happy for both guys. I'm happy for Burgos to get a win. A, a three-fight losing streak would have been real tough for him. And I'm happy that Billy Q proved that uh, he has a chance to be something, you know. There's no question about it. You know, I, I liked Burgos in this fight because I did feel – that he was a little bit cleaner as a striker, a little bit more refined. Um, and I think that was that was pretty evident in this fight. But, you know, this is one of those fights, you know, it's cliche to say, listen, Burgos got the decision, but Billy Q did not lose this fight, okay? Right. He's a guy who has showed so much heart in his fights and, again, put it on full display at MSG in, in front of a lot of his fans. And it, it was an awesome fight he's he's got some work to do as far as refining his grappling, especially in, in regards to his takedowns and, and some of his striking. He gets himself off balance and stuff, but that's also what makes him so chaotic and so dangerous as well. So if, if Billy Q can find some kind of happy medium with that, um, I, I still think he's got so much potential in that just very, very difficult division. So yeah. for Burgos, I thought it was impressive that he was able to get it done in the manner that he did because Billy Q would have taken out a lot of guys ranked higher than Burgos in there just yeah. from his pacing, his conditioning, and those shots that he was throwing. Uh, but Burgos is an animal, uh, a big win. Billy Q will get right back on track. I think he'll make those improvements and and prove that he he's one of the toughest dudes in the UFC period, man. That dude's a honey badger. Man, I love both of those guys. I really Absolutely. do. Right? I mean... Boston bias aside, no, I I really like these New Yorkers, yeah. man. Like I got a yeah. I got a place in my hat for both of them as uh, as human beings and fighters, and really happy to see them put on a show uh, inside Madison Square Garden. All right, Chudo Vera over Frankie Edgar. What a front kick, right? I mean, shades of Anderson Silva against Vitor Belfort for me. Um, you know, some might suggest he was playing with his food a little bit. Frankie Edgar was having a lot of success early on in this fight, and this fight was a minute and 10 seconds from evaporating and it could have very well been 29, 28 Edgar. I kind of felt like Cheeto was going to find the finishing shot. He is a violent motherfucker. He reaches out to Ken Flo for a day. <laughs> but you know, like, I, I don't know. I, uh, I think there's a lot to learn from Cheeto here. These three round, these three round fights can get away from you, you know, yeah. like all oh, well and good, right? He gets the bonus check and he gets Frankie's ranking and everything else. But at least on the Cheeto side, I think there's room for growth. Um, what'd you make of Cheeto's, Highlight real win over Frankie over the weekend. You know, it, we we talked about this. Cheeto can get off to a late start in his fights, and I think that was the case here yet again against Frankie Edgar, who on the other side gets off to a good start more right. often than not. And uh, Frankie was looking good, uh, and then Cheeto just continued to press forward, and both because of of Cheeto and his style, but also perhaps because of Frankie and some of the hesitancy that I've seen a little bit later in his career. Unfortunately, you got the sense for Frankie that 
it, it was going to happen at some point. It, it, like a, a lot of those exchanges in the second round, third round, you just you felt like there was this car crash that was happening. And it, it, when it came, it wasn't so much of a surprise uh, in, in a way. And, and I hate to say that because I, I'm such a huge fan, fan of Frankie and a guy who came from my era and, and, you know, wanted to see him do well here as he gets, you know, into the latter part of his career. Uh, but Cheeto is is just a hungry savage who continues to get better. And, you know, he he's just a guy that was finding success on the feet with those long range strikes and then in tight was making the adjustments with knees and uh, short uppercuts and short shots and, you know, kept pursuing the finish and, and ultimately it came uh, when he needed it. So yeah, that I thought Frankie uh, had a good solid performance, but Cheeto was just a little bit too much. And um, this was a huge win for Cheeto, man. He, he continues to impress and he's someone to watch in that division and someone who could definitely fight for the belt in the future. He's such a good guy. You know, I know in looking to my left, I know I saw UFC president Dana White was like, what was that all about when Cheeto gave Frankie the finger? You know, he flipped him the bird after the round. And uh, I think that's just Cheeto trying to sort of, you know, like he, he's in the moment trying to get himself go. Like he's real. I mean, as you can yeah. attest, like he's a really good dude and has the ultimate respect. But he's for an Frankie intense Edward. guy, right? No yeah. doubt about it. Yeah. And obviously like, he, you know, not that his career's at stake, but like his career's at stake, you know, I, I, I thought it was a very interesting fight. Um, obviously there are some things to discuss on the Frankie Edgar side. You know, I'm not in the business of retiring fighters. Yes. Um, his ability to take a shot to me certainly seems compromised. Um, that's a shot that I think would have felled lesser fighters too. But when I think about the rallies against Gray Maynard and the eight hours in the octagon, you know, I do think a lot of people are going to be calling for Frankie Edgar to not, you know, get kicked in the face by bones anymore. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I don't know what your thoughts are on Frankie at, at 40 in this stage of his career, but um, you know, if it was the last one, um, you know, he's going to the Hall of Fame. What do you think? Yeah, listen, I, I think that uh, he has had a lot of fights. And I don't care who you are. I don't care how tough you are, uh, whether you're a heavyweight or uh, a flyweight, whatever it is, this fight or this this fight game can definitely get the better of you, okay? The longer you stick around, the more it's going to take its toll on you, physically, mentally, spiritually, all that stuff. So um, Frankie was a guy that was known for his durability, and I think we're, he, we're starting to see that um, get taken away from him. And, you know, a, a legend like that, he's had an amazing career. He could have stopped a, a few years ago and – you know, he would be applauded as one of the best to do it. He, he could still do that. Um, I, I just don't I, – I hate to see a guy like that and see his his legacy tarnished. Um, and sometimes fighters can go a little bit too long. And, I, you know, maybe it's not that stage just yet. That right. is for something to, for, for Frankie and his team to decide on. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're, we're certainly seeing, you know, Frankie slow down at this point and – um, what, whatever happens moving forward, this is a guy that has been such a joy to watch. Uh, one of the best fighters that I've seen compete as far as when the lights shine brightest, this kid would turn on and deliver some of the best performances I'd ever seen. And this was, you know, uh, one of the guys when I was coming up, that was the little engine that could, right. Right. And, and right. It just, you know, upset so many people out there and accomplish so much in this sport. Um, just amazing. And not all that far removed from a win over a top 10 guy in Pedro Munoz, right? And there are matchups yes. that are less violent than Cheeto Vera in that top 15. Frankie's not going to stick around to fight the number 25 ranked guy in the world. Um, but I just think he's such a competitor that I would be very surprised if that is the last time we see him in a combat sports setting. I'm just mm -hmm. saying, I think you're getting one more Frankie Edgar fight um, at some point in time. Uh, all right. Going to rip through some of these other results, Ken Flo. Alex Pareda over Andreas Mihailidis. Joe Rogan is just frothing at the mouth when Alex Pereira is walking, having watched his entire kickboxing career. If you don't know, he does have two head-to-head -head wins over Israel Adesanya in a kickboxing realm. We weren't going to overplay that on the broadcast per se. That wasn't a directive from the UFC. We don't get any directives from the UFC in terms of fighter content, okay, right. folks? You know, just for starters. But – we didn't play too much into that. He's the only man, I believe, to knock out Israel Adesanya in kickboxing. I had a very credentialed martial artist say to me, Israel Adesanya is not going to want to stand and trade with this dude in an octagon. Um, what are your thoughts on Pareda's UFC debut? And um, 
What do you think? Uh, like he got challenged in a grappling world a little bit. I thought it was all good things for Pereira. I thought it was a perfect UFC debut. Yeah, listen, I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the Greek fighter there, Michalaitis, am I saying that right? Yeah, Michalaitis was doing his best to try to bring it into his realm and uh, put Pereira on his back. And I was impressed with the way Pereira uh, responded. You know, he did a good job of keeping his base, getting back to his feet. And, um, you know, made the proper adjustments in a round two. Pereira just did what he does. That double knee has has worked for him a lot over the course of his kickboxing career. He's long. He's lanky. He hits extremely hard. You think you're out of reach, and he finds a way uh, to get to your chin, and you're sleeping. You're asking what happened in the fight. And I think Pereira is going to continue to surprise a lot of people in the UFC. That's a very tough matchup. I think he's with a good team. I think if he continues to work on his grappling, his wrestling, his ability to get back to his feet, he's going to be a problem. And we could have that showdown between him and Adesanya, uh, which would be a huge fight. Pereira is going to be a huge fan pleaser. And um, yeah, I, I thought this was a good test for him because he he did have to battle. He did have to battle back. We did see a test of his yeah. grappling skills. So uh, Pereira is an absolute savage. And uh, I think we're going to see more of him, uh, a more, more exciting fights from him. Now, I don't watch a lot of kickboxing. You're not allowed to use elbows in that sport. Is that correct? In glory. Yeah, in glory kickboxing. Glory. Yeah, they, they, you weren't able to to throw elbows. Yeah. All right. So Alex Pereira is probably going to reach out to Ken Flo to figure out exactly how to open up. You hear the shout out? <laughs> I don't think back. he needs me, dude. He's about, of course I did, Anna. Yeah. Of course. Dude. You're the man, dude. Managed to shout it. out you and Brian Stan this weekend. <laughs> Hell not, yeah. Uh, my initiative. Let's go, Stan. Glover Teixeira, though, and if you don't know, Alex Pereira lives in Danbury, Connecticut, and trains with Glover Teixeira and has been yes. in Danbury, I think, for about 18 months, even though he's worked for Glover far longer than that. Um, but Glover stopped the fighter meeting essentially to say, like, this guy has a lot of physical strength in the grappling world. Like, he picks up things very quickly there, right. and I think it, there are some really encouraging signs in terms of what Pereira is going to do on the ground. And I will say in terms of Joe Rogan's enthusiasm, Unless I'm repeating myself, he was excited about Gokan Saki too, but not to this degree. You know, yeah. um, did I just yep. say that a minute ago? All yeah. right. So, a few other prelims that I wanted to uh, to get to here. Um, Chris Curtis, one of the biggest underdogs on the card over Phil Hawes. You know, Phil Hawes had the opportunity to fight this guy on 24 hours notice. And I don't know if karma is the right word, but a lot of us were surprised when Phil Hawes didn't take that fight. And Phil said at his media scrum this week, you know, I want to be a world champion. I want to watch film on this guy. I don't want to do anything hastily in my quest to become a world champion. And he also said, you know, I don't want to just take this guy down for 15 minutes and win the fight that way. Ugh, yikes, right? So yeah. going to be hard to become a world champion when you lose as a six to one favorite here against Chris Curtis. And I say that with all due respect, like I really do like Phil Hawes. I still think the ceiling's high. I love the camp returns are very good coming out of that camp. Um, but you know, he said, I want Chris to like perseverate over the, the Phil Hawes film and whatever else. And Phil Hawes with Sean Strickland, excuse me, Chris Curtis with Sean Strickland in his corner just was like, you know what? I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity. I'm going to, uh, you know, throw caution to the wind a little bit. Once he got going, uh, he didn't miss. And uh, Hawes paid the ultimate price. So I was texting my buddy while this fight was going on. And I said, Phil Hawes has really improved his striking. He's throwing good straight punches. He's putting together really good combinations. But he, he's keeping his head, um, you know, right in that pocket there. He's not moving it off the center line. He's just leaving it hanging out there. And, you know, if Curtis goes and throws a shot down the middle, this it's going to be trouble. Um, and sure enough, that's exactly what Curtis did. Landed a huge shot, took Haas out of there. Haas has so much potential, man. He, you, you could, oh, you could see it for a long time. He, he is getting better, but that was a major mistake. And, and, and this is something that I hope he learns from, uh, and rectifies, uh, because yeah, th it was just a, a major mistake and yeah. And, and you, and you could also argue, Hey, why weren't you trying to take him down more? You know, it seemed like he was disengaging from the wrestling should have been using that wrestling a little bit more, but either way, I think he found out that, um, he's got a big, uh, you know, thing he's got to fix there. And this was a huge upset win for Curtis and, uh, yeah, kind of back to the drawing board a little bit, but I, yeah. I do think Haas's potential is high. I, I do think he can learn from this and, and move up the rankings yet again. And how good do you feel for Chris Curtis? I know he was not one of the six bonus winners for performance. What a good guy. Bonus winners, but it took him 10 years, 35 fights to get to the UFC. And, wow. uh, you know, he had some, I mean, you could, did you call any of his PFL fights or no? No, Chris I don't Curtis? think so. So he fought, 
Magomed Karimov. Uh, Karimov, way back in the day, yeah. Before, yeah Sorry, Magomed Karimov, you got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah uh, in PFL, no, and Ray Cooper the third, yes. I believe, and he fought Bilal Muhammad way back in Indiana in 2014. And when he was on the Contender Series, Chris Curtis in 2018 had a win, a finish. Thought he was getting a deal, didn't get one. Goes home talking to his son who was like a few weeks old when he made his pro debut and was like, dude, I think I got to retire. His son was like, dad, what are you going to do? I told this on the broadcast, but I think you're in commercial. Yeah. It's like, dad, what are you going to do? And his dad's like, yeah, shit, you're right, son. I think I'll keep fighting, you know, and so glad he was able to realize that moment. Um, and it's about a lot more than just the the UFC fight kit for uh, for Chris Curtis. Uh, but was it Kenneth Capello you were texting your buddy Kenneth? He's probably the I, was guy I owe an apology to for uh, – <laughs> You know, a lot of people were commenting on my post about Kamzat Chimaev. And, okay. you know, I do think there's some selective listening going on. And, you know, just because I say one thing about Kamzat Chimaev, I'm not making any statement about Leon Edwards and his credentials. Right. You know, I've said right. Leon Edwards is worthy of a title sure. shot. Colby Covington, I thought, was worthy of a welterweight championship opportunity. But if Jorge Masvidal beats Leon Edwards, you know, it's not as though there are a million options for Usman. And it's not as though there are a million options for Kamzat Chimaev. And Yuri Prohaska is 2-0 oh in the UFC and getting a championship opportunity. So Dana doesn't seem to have an appetite for Chimaev getting a title fight. I certainly think Chimaev should have to test himself in a main event setting against Gilbert Burns or Vicente Luque. I was asking everybody on the ground, if you were the promoter, what fight would you make for Chimaev? Right. right? And nobody could give me an answer right away. But after some thought. Well thought answers mostly were Vicente Luque versus Hamzat Shimaya. So maybe that's the fight. Maybe Gilbert Burns is the fight. You know, um, yeah. I don't know. It's going to be interesting. I'd like to see somebody in there that I think can deal with the physicality and the strength uh, right. in the grappling world. Um, but we'll see. You know, yeah, listen, and that's why I, I like both of those uh, options. I like the Gilbert Burns option. Uh, I think Vicente Luque would be. Uh, another tremendous fight as well. And if he goes out there and delivers another dominant performance, like what, what can you say, you know, and, and all of his training partners are saying, saying the right things. But um, yeah, I, I, I think he needs, a, I, I want to see him in that big fight against a dude who has a ton of experience, you know, a yeah. uh, top five guy, uh, because I also think it's going to set himself up. It's going to set Hamzat uh, to be that much more successful in the yeah. future. So yeah. uh, again, uh, a lot of potential in that dude and uh, a lot more exciting fights on the way for sure. All right. If you had to send one welterweight in the world in there to beat Kamar Usman with a full training camp, right? The question beckons, who would you send in there now? Mm. I still think after what we saw this weekend, that a certain percentage of people would take Colby Covington, right? Because, they know he can take a beating, and even though we saw a gap in overall skill that yep. he's been able to last almost 10 rounds with the man, I do believe if you pulled the fan base, though, and they had to send one man in there, you'd get some votes for Wonder Boy, you'd get some votes for maybe Luke A or whatever. I do think most people would send Hamza Chimaev in there to, like, save a dog's life if they had to send one welterweight in there to beat Usman. However he is in the rankings, I think most people Absolute. would send Shimaev in there. Well, listen, you're bringing up a good point, right? Because I, I agree. Why? Because of his wrestling, number one, right? That's like the one guy who could potentially out-wrestle Usman. He's got the size. Uh, he has power in his hands as well. So I, I think more than anything else, there's two things. Does he have the skills? Does he have the background? Absolutely. Does he deserve it? Uh, you know, I don't know because here's the thing. Welterweight is a different division than say 205 pounds, 205 pounds, a little bit sure. more slim. They don't have sure. as many guys. Welterweight. Sure. There's so many guys that are hanging around, but um, yeah. So I, I think as far as what he's accomplished, does he deserve it? No. Does he have the skills to absolutely go out there right. and do Two it and win? Conversations. 100%. And I, I, I would agree with you. If there's one guy you're like, listen, uh, yeah, to save a dog's life that can beat Usman, Usman yeah. skill for skill, how they match up, I uh, couldn't agree more. I mean, my speculation suggests that they're waiting for that Edwards Masvidal result. And if Leon emerges, then that would be enough to to grant him that elusive first championship opportunity against Kamara. So uh, mm -hmm. we will see what happens there. So the ESPN news package of prelims, Kenny, those four fights combined to last like 21 minutes and 52 seconds, right? <laughs> but the majority of that was Nasordini Mavov against Edmund Shabazian. Shabazian, I believe, has now lost three in a row. Nasordini Mavov is going to be in the top 11 at the very least 
least. And uh, Fernand Lopez is going to get my coach of the year award at the end of the year. I know you're going to give yours to Trevor Whitman and we can't be on the same side. Breaking news. OK, yes. Ken Plus coach of the year is Trevor Whitman. Great. OK, um, but I'm giving it to Fernand Lopez because of the development of Cito Gone the development of Francis Ngannou back in the day. Sometimes I like to go, I like to go like lifetime achievement award. And now he's got this Nasordini Mavov man who, if you don't know now, you know, right? I mean, this is a real problem. And I think he could be a dark horse in this division. Any thoughts for us on that bout before we get to Ian Gary? A couple things. First of all, uh, I agree with you on Lopez, uh, what he's done uh, in a country like France that isn't known for its mixed martial arts background, right? Up, they produced a, a ton of great martial artists in judo and savat, Muay Thai. They, they've produced a lot of great uh, martial artists there. But as far as MMA, it, it's still illegal there. And the fact that he's producing that kind of talent says a lot. Uh, but Imovov, I thought, was very impressive. He's a dude that in his UFC debut, I remember when I was uh, researching him, I, I was really blown away. Uh, by his composure, his skill, um, another Dagestani fighter, uh, you know, that grew, grew up in France, that uh, comes from a striking background, not a wrestling background, but clearly is picking up the wrestling and, and uh, is not too shabby in that department as well. This was a huge win for him, and he's someone to watch, man. Watch out for this guy. I'm telling you. All right, so Ian Gary, the former Cage Warriors champion with much fanfare, made his UFC debut and uh, some compromising moments early, but he gets Jordan Williams out of there by knockout 459 of the first round. No performance bonus, but a lot of ground gain for the 23-year-old uh, Ian Gary. He'll be 24 here in a few days. And he is as confident as any fighter I have seen come into the UFC in years. But yet there is a humility about his ability and where he is at, right? He wants to be progressively built by the UFC because he wants to be able to go in there and dominate someone with just his grappling. So say what you will about the bravado and the confidence. He knows exactly what he wants to do. He knows exactly what he wants to say. But yet everything he says seems to be rooted in skill development before it's rooted in give me the big fight. So I'm really impressed with this young man. And uh, obviously he... Has a lot to learn, but there's a lot of room to grow, and uh, he might just be a world champion one day. Your thoughts on Ian Gary? Yeah, I think that's the right approach for Ian Gary. I, I think, you know, if you've seen his fights outside of the UFC, you know this kid has a lot of potential. Um, I think we saw that once he settled down and, and got the jitters out and was able to find his timing out there. Uh, he did what he what, what he was supposed to do. It was a beautiful shot. That is a very difficult shot to throw and land and get the knockout with. Um, you know, certainly had shades of his Irishman uh, friend there, Conor McGregor, with yeah. that, you know, shot. Uh, and um, yeah, I, I thought it was a, a good overall performance and, and one that he learned a lot from. Uh, you know, fighting an MSG for the first time in UFC debut is no easy task. Yeah. Uh, and in the end, once he settled down, I, I thought it was impressive. All right. So last thing before we get on out of here and thanks to everybody uh, for joining us today and for indulging us. I knew we were going to go long just in terms of this sportsmanship angle. You just love to see it, right? Like as much heat as there was on both of these championship fights. And you can be sure there's no love lost between Rose Nama Yunus and John Whitley, right. right? Like you can be sure behind closed doors, you know, um, but. It started with Dustin Jacoby, right? Striking low on John Allen a couple times and just the way he apologized, right? And then Nasordini Mavov after getting Edmund Shabazian in the crucifix, right? Being like, I'm sorry, man. You know, I ain't trying to hurt anybody in there, right? And then it just continued all night long, the embrace between Gaethje and Chandler, the embrace between Usman and Covington and Covington saying, you know, I'm just trying to make you money, you know, on and on. It went all night long. And obviously the the sort of crowning example was Chris Barnett sort of giving his post-fight interview to John Vellante at Madison Square Garden, um, you know, really good to see, man. You know, really good I, to see. I agree, man. You know, listen, the, the martial arts spirit uh, is alive and well, and it shows that you can still fight your ass off and, and go out there to try to hurt the other, not try to hurt the other guy, but go out there and fight hard and try to win with every weapon you have and also be respectful, right? Because I think a lot of times those lines are are so often blurred and we think that, you know, MMA fighters are just straight out savages and former criminals or guys that just, you know, would be fighting on the street if they didn't have the UFC or didn't have professional mixed martial arts. And it's just not the case. There's a lot of guys that are very humble, that understand how much work is put in. 
and they know that if they're working hard and they're putting all the effort yeah. in, they know what the other guy is putting in too. Yeah. And, and they have a respect. Anytime there's an exchange of uh, of that kind of, um, you know, when, when you're out there using everything you have and you're putting your heart out there, yeah. you, you have to be able to respect your opponent, even if you don't really like them. So right. uh, it was great to see, man. You're linked for life. I mean, that's yeah. it, period. Like, you guys are linked for life. And I know it's great when you're able to uh, run into old foes. I mean, it'll be so cool the next time you run into Jose Aldo whenever that uh, ends up happening. If it's him with one of his Brazilian fighters, you just never know yeah. how that's going to happen. And I don't know how many listeners or viewers, like, stop watching when we talk about sportsmanship. But I'll take a little shot at Ken Flaw on the way out if you're still watching. You see that picture of him behind him with Clay Guida. If you go to UFC Fight Pass, like... Kenny doesn't go over and make sure Clay's okay. <laughs> so wait a second. I think I may have. Maybe he did. I yeah, yeah. Maybe he did. <laughs> but he certainly doesn't remember going out of his way to make sure that Clay was okay after <laughs> busting up his face and nearly choking him unconscious. All right, what that is going to do it wow. for uh, today. Thanks to uh, Ray Longo, Aaron Bronstetter, James Krause, and ExploringPodcast.com for all of your merchandise needs. One more sleep gear can be found at millions.co. We are working on a new design, though. Uh, pillowcases. One I like more sleep pillowcases. Lay your head down flat. Hell yeah. My wife was suggesting maybe one of those wrap around your neck things that says one more sleep as well. Um, and can we get an I finish fights shirt and a big dick energy? No, uh, a big anic energy, not big dick energy. Big anic energy shirts coming to anicflooringpodcast.com. Big anic energy and I finish fights will be your next two designs. Um, also, don't forget, remember the show with Bilal Muhammad. Bilal, my brother tells me it's actually not Bilal, folks. It's like Jose Bilal? Aldo, Bilal Muhammad. Bilal. Anyway, I will say, and I know there's a little Bilal bias on this program, right? Yeah. He's one of the maybe five or six guys who has some percentage of a chance to get the Hamzat Chimaev fight. And that was really the big part of my message last week was that if you are one of these welterweight contenders, that's the fight. You know, if you want the bag, you want the title shot, you call that guy out, get on his radar and get that fight. You yeah. know, that's, you know, that's like boardwalk and park place in one. You know what I mean? So, and I think Bilal's one of the guys who has the physicality maybe and the strength. You know, Bilal's thesis statement on this fight is, let me feel that strength. Right. I want to feel that strength. And that should be his calling card in trying to get the fight. Well, you know, let me feel it. Absolutely. Listen, there's guys who are, you know, out there to just compete. There's guys who are out there to be famous. There's guys that are out there uh, to make money. There's out. There's guys who want to be a champion. But there's also the rare guy that wants to fight the best right that, that was my mentality anyway i wanted to test my martial arts skill right. who's the dude who's the guy that everyone says is the best let, let me fight that guy let me test myself yeah. against that dude and uh bilal uh is a guy who wants to fight the best he wants to test himself and i love it because he's a guy who's been climbing up the rankings not many people are, are calling out hamzat shimaev he's one of the few i love it man I love yeah. i love that attitude and Ken Flo said to me in like 2012, right after he retired, he's like, if I can't, if I can't be champion, I'm just going to buy Bitcoin 10 years ahead of all these motherfuckers. And then I won't have to worry about a thing. All right. Appreciate everybody watching. Our executive producer is Cody Merrow. Cody, tell Bilal to listen till the end of the show. How about Shale calling him Blahal? Can't fucking Blahal. get it right. As much Love as it. my man Shale tries to put Mr. Muhammad over, he just can't get his name right. Thank you all for watching, for subscribing. Tell your friends. We will talk to you next week. Until then, yo fucking later.